Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the December 5th, 2018 meeting of the North Carolina State Board of Education. If you could please take your seats so that we can get started. Again, welcome to this December 5th, 2018 meeting of the North Carolina State Board of Education. Uh, my name is Eric Davis, Chairman of the Board, and I call this meeting to order. Before we start with the uh, formal agenda, I'd like for us to pause for just a moment. Um, our, our nation experienced the loss of, of a uh, terrific leader, our 41st President, uh, George H.W. Bush, recently, and today is, is a day of uh, remembrance and mourning on his behalf. But in addition, um, we lost one of our own recently, um, a Robeson County student, Miss Angular. And so in memory of both of them and in thoughtful consideration for their families, I'd like for us to pause for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. In addition, um, at our next meeting in January, we'll have the opportunity to, uh, to be joined by our most recent Digman Award winner, uh, who'll be joining the board. And I understand that he's in attendance today, Mr. Christian Overton. Mr. Overton, are you present with us? He hasn't gotten here yet. Well, well, we wish to pass on to him our, our greetings and remind him that he has some really big shoes to fill. Uh, yes. In uh, Ms. Roberta Scott's, and so we'll welcome him at our, at our next meeting. Okay. I now welcome board members, advisors, staff, on-site visitors, online listeners, and Twitter followers. And for our visitors and those listening online, today's agenda involves our board committee sessions, and tomorrow's agenda is the official meeting when the board will vote on its action items. I remind board members that it's our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest as we handle the work of this board. Does any member of the board know of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting? If so, please state them for the record. And if during the course of the meeting you become aware of an actual or apparent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on the matter. Board members, you've seen the agenda for a week and have had the opportunity to review it. I ask if there are any requests for changes to the agendas, and if not, I seek a motion for approval. Is there such a motion? So moved. Motion by Mr. Buxton, second. Second. Second by Ms. Willoughby. Dr. Townsend Smith, will you call the roll to capture the vote? Mr. Buxton? Yes. Dr. Oxendine? Yes. Ms. Kamnitz? Yes. Ms. Willoughby? Yes. Mr. McDevitt? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. M Mr. Chastain? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. State Treasurer Falwell? <laughs> Vice Chair Duncan? Yes. Chairman Davis? Yes. Ms. Unanimous. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. We have an agenda. So we'll now proceed directly to our committee meetings and begin with the Education, Innovation, and Charter Schools Committee, and I'll turn to the Chair, Ms. White. Uh, thank you, Chair Davis. Good morning, everyone. I am Amy White, and I have the honor and privilege of serving with Mr. Wayne McDevitt um, she, as she Chairs leaves. of the Education, Innovation, and Charter School Committee. We have quite a um, robust number of items to discuss this morning. We'll start off um, with EICS-1, and that is a presentation for the North Carolina Virtual Public School Annual Report. And I think I have um, Liz Colbert, Dr. Liz Colbert, who is going to um, provide the introduction for that. Good morning. Good morning, greetings. I am Liz Colbert, and I am the proud executive director for the North Carolina Virtual Public School. So 2017-18 was an outstanding year for the virtual school. Our enrollments were over 56,000. We increased our co-teacher partnerships. You may remember a few months ago, Dr. Taylor from Bladen County came and presented about the Math One co-teaching. We've expanded that to English Two and to Biology, the EOC subjects. 
Um, and we've really worked to make our already flexible environment more flexible. And our, our schools and districts have made it clear that flexible is never overrated. So every year we are required to present to you an annual report. This report is required in legislation. It has to include things about financial impact, teacher salaries, um, impact to districts, enrollment, student achievement data, et cetera. And all of that is here for your review. It is an electronic report. Um, and we all know, though, that annual reports are often received with the same enthusiasm as you get when you snap uh, your wrist with a Band-Aid. But we are going to try to use it as an opportunity to tell our story. And I, we have a student here with us, and I'm going to introduce her in just a minute. As you know, our mission is to provide equity and access for courses for students in North Carolina, regardless of their zip code. Another way I like to say that is we help students in North Carolina reach their dreams. For example, this year we had a student who was the finalist on The Voice, the TV show. We have a full-time professional cricket player on our roll. We have two students who competed in the Confucius Institute, I have to look at my notes, at NC State, the ninth annual Chinese language um, speech and writing contest. We have students who are working fully online in order to train and with the dream of going to the MBA, and we even have a pro surfer. <laughs> <laughs> but to explain the impact, so that's the impact of NCVPS. You have the numbers, the information, all that is required, but it is the lives of the students that explain NCVPS. So with us, I've invited Elizabeth McDonald to co-present with me. She is here virtually. She is a senior at Hoggard High School in Wilmington. Elizabeth has taken five NCVPS courses with her in her academic career. She's a volunteer in our NCVPS Peer Tutoring Center. She is also the student lead for our virtual buddy program, which is a program to reach out to students in the affective domain, helping them log on, navigate the process. Um, she, in college, she plans to study statistics, political science, and Mandarin Chinese, and hopes to one day hold elected office. I won't have to tell you to remember her name, because after you hear from her, you won't be able to forget her name. <laughs> so I'm going to virtually turn over the mic to Elizabeth McDonald from Wilmington. Hello, everyone. I, uh I'm really glad to be speaking to you today, and thank you, Dr. Colbert, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, as she said, my name is Elizabeth MacDonald, and I'm a high school senior from Wilmington, North Carolina. Now, uh, NCVPS has been a significant part of my academic career since middle school, and being a part of the NCVPS community has impacted me in three significant ways. The first two are quite academic in nature, and the last one is more broadly related to my personal growth. So I started taking NCVPS classes in eighth grade. I took two courses, World History and Earth and Environmental Science, for high school credit, which allowed me to have more uh, flexibility in my high school schedule, which allowed me to take marching band and concert band, which I initially thought I would be able to fit into my high school schedule. And it's also allowed me to take advantage of my school's international baccalaureate curriculum, which is uh, on a similar level of rigor to advanced placement courses. Um, so in high school, I took three units of Mandarin Chinese through NCPS, uh, Mandarin 1, Mandarin 2, and Honored Mandarin 3. And being able to take Mandarin Chinese wasn't an option in my local public school district. So NCPS allowed me to uh, take a language that was really important to me. I'm half Chinese. My grandmother speaks uh, limited English, so being able to learn Chinese has enabled me to communicate with her more effectively, which has been really special to me, and I'm really uh, glad for the opportunity to take Mandarin through NCVPS. And because I took three units of Mandarin 
through NCBPS in my freshman and sophomore years, I was eligible to be the pilot student for my school's International Baccalaureate Mandarin Chinese program, which has the same level of difficulty as an AP Chinese course. And I'm the only student in this program right now. Uh, there'll be one other student in the year uh, below me who will um, actually be able to take that class face to face with a high school Mandarin teacher on campus that the school district is planning to hire because of my efforts taking IB Mandarin within my school district. Actually, I take uh, IB Mandarin at a middle school in my district uh, with a, a, a class of seventh graders, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and I work with my teacher outside of school to uh, get the additional content I need to be ready for my international baccalaureate exam at the end of the year. And uh, my, I think the most um, special part of my NCBPS experience has been volunteering with the NCBPS Peer Tutoring Center, as Dr. Colbert mentioned. Uh, I've been a volunteer with the Peer Tutoring Center since my freshman year. Uh, I've been tutoring students, guest writing for the Peer Tutoring Center's blog, the uh, Tutor Talk, and mentoring students through the Virtual Buddy program. And the PTC provided me with one of my first leadership experiences in high school. And it's really taught me a lot about being responsible, managing my time, being organized. And also, it's been an amazing opportunity to improve my public speaking and communication skills. I've spoken at several uh, academic conferences around North Carolina since uh, joining the Peer Tutoring Center. And, um, also, being the Peer Tutoring Center Virtual Buddy Program lead has taught me the skills I need to take advantage of other opportunities at my school um, to support my peers. Uh, for instance, I am the president of my school's academic tutoring program, which provides uh, tutoring services in all four subjects to students at my school. And I also coordinated uh, the freshman orientations over the summer for students at my school enter entering the IB program. Um, so really, NCBPS has been one of the foundations of my high school education, both in the, the growth of my personal skills, leadership skills, and just learning a lot more about myself and strengthening my uh, academic skills as well. So, uh, as Dr. Colbert mentioned, I'm planning to pursue statistics, political science, and Mandarin Chinese in college. And I'm hoping that uh, Mandarin will give me a strong advantage in uh, my future academic endeavors and my professional career as I want to uh, go into the public policy field uh, and hopefully run for an elected office at the state or national level someday. And uh, additionally, I'm planning to apply to Duke Kunshan University in China. And I think without my prior Mandarin experiences through NCPS, I wouldn't have the confidence or the bravery to uh, apply to an international university on the other side of the world. So I'm very glad for all of the opportunities that NCPS has given me, and I uh, welcome any questions that you have about my NCBPS experiences, either in the Peer Tutoring Center or uh, on the NCBPS academic side of things. Thank you so much. So are there questions for Elizabeth? I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road with the students. NCBPS was an academic avenue for her, but taught leadership, um, coaching skills for other people. Um, it, it, it's been a whole package for Elizabeth. So what do you want to know from her? Hi, hi Elizabeth, this is Amy White. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, I'm just excited to hear that you were able to add that additional flexibility into your IB program. I know that's a very demanding, rigorous curriculum. And so the 
the fact that you were able to manage um, the the extra things like band um, along with your your Mandarin and all of the other courses that IB requires, I think is a terrific asset. How would you um, how would you say your interaction is with um, your 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 educators with North Carolina VPS? Have you been pleased with the type of support that you've received um, through those programming, through that through that programming? Yes, so I, uh, I was definitely pleasantly surprised when I started taking NCVPS classes in eighth grade with how uh, easy it was to communicate with my NCVPS teachers. Um, a lot of the teachers that I've had would respond to my uh, instant messages or text messages within the same class period that um, I sent the message in. So it was as if I had the teacher right there addressing questions for me and they were always really quick to respond to my emails and they had provided really thorough feedback on my assignments that I thought I would only be able to get in a face-to-face -face class. Now the, the teaching style is obviously different just because of the platform it's on and I think that um, just based on my own learning style, I think I'm a pretty self-driven learner and I'm willing to uh, reach out for extra support if I need it. So I think really the NCVPS platform was really an excellent way to supplement my education and provided me with all the tools I needed to do well in the classes that I took through NCVPS. That's a great answer. <laughs> We do have an NCVPS teacher in the room with us, Freebird McKinney, also teaches for NCVPS. So, Ms. White. Ms. White, I think Ms. Scott has a... Uh, good morning, Elizabeth. You have really made such a great presentation. And uh, for thank that, you. I do indeed thank you. Now, you have been so successful with your challenging course have you uh, noticed that more students are kind of stepping up to the plate maybe and thinking about going into the virtual, you know, working with virtual classes? I think based on my experience with my friends and just the NCPS students that I know at Hoggard is that um, I think my school has uh, quite a number of NCPS students mm -hmm. uh, just because it adds that extra flexibility to a lot of students' schedules, a lot of students. Oh. My um, ELA, my um, e-learning advisor, actually told us told me that we have about 700 NCVPS students at Hogger, and I think a lot of those students wow. are taking that classes great. for that additional scheduling flexibility, being able to take additional AP classes, um, or if there just isn't enough room in classes that we have on campus, it allows students to take uh, those classes and, and get uh, those credits maybe sooner than they would have if only face-to-face -face classes were available. Mm -hmm. Does that address your question? It does, and I mean, that's wonderful to have that number, and it does allow students to spread out and expand and be able to take more courses that they absolutely would not be able to get in regular classrooms. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And also, students don't have to give up, like she said, band no. in order to get the mm -hmm. core that she needs or the language right. that she mm -hmm. needs to That's graduate on time with her peers. Mm -hmm. So it is equity and access across North Carolina, but it's also the ability to pursue your dreams. You can take band and Spanish and mm -hmm. not struggle with picking and choosing because you only have six periods or however many periods you have in a day. So. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Free bird. No, you go ahead. Okay. So, Elizabeth, I think you're a great example of how the, the IB <laughs> schedule kind of books you and, 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 uh, and holds you to certain classes, and this is an excellent opportunity to get those other classes. But I was interested to know, did you use all of your peer tutoring, any of the other services that you, you're working with to help your fellow students in NCVPS as part of your CAS project? Did you tie any of that in uh, together? I am counting uh, a lot of my tutoring hours for uh, CAS, Good. Uh, for sure, and I've also counted the presentations that I've given on behalf of NCPS towards CAS. Excellent. It's, it's been re really nice to just be able to take something that I already love doing and I've already been doing for a long time and count that towards one of my graduation 
uh, requirements for the IB diploma. Excellent. Great work. Mm -hmm. And for those who, who don't know, CAS stands for Creativity, Action, and Service, and it's a component of the IB program that all students are required to complete. Uh, typically, it's about 150 service hours. It's in a, a, about a two-year um, kind of uh, followed through project. So I just wanted to make that it's because it sounds like she's dedicating a ton of hours to that. So great work, Elizabeth. Thank you. Elizabeth, this is uh, Eric Davis. Um, in, in addition to um, thanking you for sharing your story with us, I'd like to know where to send the check. <laughs> you start your campaign. Um, and, and second, and more seriously, um, I mean, it's great that the number of students that you mentioned that yes. have, have taken advantage of this opportunity, but um, do you have any advice for us for how to make this, these types of opportunities more accessible and available to more students? Um, I think uh, based on my experience and what I've seen in NCBPS and also what I've seen and heard from my peers is that um, I feel like sometimes the content itself in NCVPS classes um, go out of, out of date just because external links are broken, videos aren't available anymore, or just content um, that might have been in previous versions of the classes is in the course when it really shouldn't be. So just making sure that courses stay up to date across the board um, for all students would be really helpful in just taking out some of the confusion uh, when we're going through our NCPS courses. Really That's yeah, that was an excellent response. It thank was. you very much. Yeah, we appreciate your advice. Yes. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time this morning. We appreciate um, your dedication to your, um, to your studies, and we wish you Godspeed um, with your um, next step, whether it's um, overseas or here in the United States. Uh, we know you will be successful in, in whatever you choose to do. Dr. Colbert. Thank you, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So we wanted to conclude by taking a few minutes just to look at the report. The link to the report is on eBoard. Um, that's what it looks like. It says draft because it is your vote that makes it official. Um, the report is divided up into the key areas I mentioned, some highlights, teacher pay, student success data. But the great thing about a digital report is that you can search it for the information that's relevant to you. You don't have to mark a book or flip the pages to find what you want to find. So I brought with me a few NCVPS experts who can go around and help you look up the things you want to look for about the next few minutes. Um, Chris Covey on the end, he's one of our newest team members, Instructional Director for Social Studies. Um, Brian Stevens, he is our Director of Technology, and Mia Murphy is our Director of Outreach, and she's the one who put this report together. So she knows every inch of it way better than most people. So I appreciate them for being here, but they can just walk around and um, look at the report, ha help you look at the report. Um, so just, you want to just, okay. So this is, this is an example. This is the scorecard. We used to give this out in um, paper format to each superintendent, but, and this is statewide, the top enrolling districts, you can see New Hanover is right up there. Um, we have the charter schools grouped together, and then you can see Marie Mia did the drop down menu, and you can either pick all, if you want to look at the state, or pick the five or six closest to you, pick the one district you live in, and then it'll search and show you just that. Same with the top courses. If you want to know, well, what are they enrolling and what courses are they taking in New Hanover? You can see what they're taking. Yeah, okay. So those are the top enrolling courses for New Hanover. Now you may have noticed statewide our top enrolling courses are the still the Occupational Course of Study program. Those are courses for students who have significant learning challenges. Um, and so that is our most popular program. It is a co-teaching program. 
but it allow, it's a diploma track for students on the occupational course of study program, and those courses are delivered in partnership with the DPIEC division. I'm having trouble getting out. So do you want to look at um, the financial part? Well, the teacher pay has to be there, but as our teachers will tell you, they want to raise, but they have not had one in many years. Um, that's our teacher of the year. You met her virtually. Um, remember, her husband was deployed, and she's not in North Carolina right now. But we pay teachers by enrollment. I think I will get there. It, it, it went away on me. I went to another to the So while the internet thinks about it, you can see the courses the same way. We have about 150 of them. We do say 612, but the bulk of them are 912. We're getting requests from superintendents to build middle school core. So we're looking into that right now. Ms. Oxford, did you have a question? I do. Just remind me of, I mean, when I hear <coughs> you say our teachers haven't had a raise in quite a while, that's stunning. <laughs> so my question is this. Why are they also employed as a regular teacher, and in addition, this is an additional? For about 70, just under 70% of them do teach somewhere else in the state, and this is their second job. So instead of working at um, Belts or Applebee's, they work for us in the evening. Our model is asynchronous, which was interesting that Elizabeth said her teachers have been able to respond within the class period. Mm -hmm. That's not always possible, but we do require the teachers, and you can back me up, to respond within 24 hours. And if, if and it's the virtual classroom, we can check that. We check that. We look at that. Because online learning for NCBPS should be personal. It should be based in a teacher-student relationship. It should not feel like the great machine, even though it wouldn't happen without the great machine. It should not feel like the great machine. Is well, it, it's truly personalized learning. We talk mm -hmm. about that term yes. quite profusely, but here is the perfect example of it. So, um, they're pay, the, t the teachers are paid based on enrollment. Is there some ratio? They're paid um, per s the number of students in their class. So it's 306. So for every student in the class, they get paid $306. So if you have 20, it's 306 times 20 or 30. All right, thank you. And we keep our class sizes at around 25, just like the face-to-face -face classrooms, because if you're going to deliver personalized learning, you can't, it's difficult when you've got 50 or 60. But I'll just point out this one final thing in closing. We are working with Quality Matters, and I know Dr. Oxenbaum, you know about Quality Matters. They are um, the national expert in quality and online learning. We have put that many courses through their filter to get their accreditation on our courses, and we will continue to do more. It's not free to do it, or we put them all in right away. Um, but our goal initially was to have one from each subject area. And now we have one that is AP and some electives, and so we're just going to keep putting them through. We get good feedback on how to improve them if they need to be improved, or and or we get a steep seal of approval. So that's important to know. In this um, climate, when NCVPS came into existence 11 years ago, we were really the only game in town. So this matters now, accreditation matters, and so I just wanted to point that out. That's on the course page along with the course catalog. Mr. Buxton, then Dr. Oxidine, mm -hmm. then Mr. McKinney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Colbert, who, by the way, was my first child's first principal. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say how old my first child is. No, I know. I've suddenly aged. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would there be a, a couple districts you might suggest use NCVPS particularly well and strategically to extend course offerings and really think about how they move students through personalized paths? Yes, and Hanover is really exceptional. Dr. Markley has been a partner of ours and a thought partner of ours for quite some time. Um, the other place is Bladen County. Um, Dr. Taylor is using it to 
you know, he has trouble recruiting teachers, you know, so he's using it to provide the courses, but he's also using it to help children who are struggling, which is why he's our champion for the co-teaching model. So he, um, he came, but, you know, he's, but he, he'll talk to you about it. He's about to be chair of our advisory council. So. Thank you. And then there's others, depending on what you want to know, like some districts use it for core because that's how they deliver the core. Mm -hmm. And then some districts like Wake use it for specialty areas like AP Computer Science, Japanese. You know, everybody struggles with Japanese, getting enough Japanese teachers. So um, if there's a particular thing you want to know, we can connect you with the right place. That's probably the best way to do it. But they all have rationale around how they enroll and what they ask students, which students do enroll. Dr. Oxenine, returning to quality matters, what processes do you have in place to ensure that course all the links are operative? All the, talk about that because that that can really drive a student and a teacher up the wall. So we have a layer of um, so we have something we call instructional leader and and a course lead, and that would equate to the department chair in the school. And the instructional leader or course lead is responsible for that kind of thing, checking through the course, checking through the content, um, and making sure everything is working. Um, I will follow up with her on that. <laughs> it sounds um, more than I imagined. How about that? Um, so we also have our technology team that works with the courses, and our curriculum team, they work together to make sure things are working but through the Quality Matters revision process, you know, we go through it with a fine-tooth comb. Right. Mm -hmm. So, very good. Thanks. And revision, Thank you. revision Thank you. is ongoing. Yeah. It, it never stops. We have a revision process. We run link validation through the courses. We identify broken links, um, preferably before, like, the end of a semester in the beginning when we do new course copies. So there's a full process. And if there is something that is missed, it could be an announcement link. They can report that to us through the help desk, and we usually get back to them within minutes or hour. Perfect. And we have it fixed. So it's an ongoing Sounds process. And, okay, we're working towards <coughs> the end. Mr. McKinney, and then one final question with well, Mr. McDonough. I, I just wanted to comment on the, the level of relationships that you actually have the opportunity to build in these courses. And um, kind of speaking to, to your question, so a lot of my students, they, I, I teach AP Euro on, 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 for NCVPS. They didn't have that class offered at their school, so they'd still have that opportunity. But then I had a, literally a student at my high school who couldn't fit that schedule, fit, fit that course into her schedule, so she took it in our, in our distance lab and then, you know, could bounce back and forth and ask questions and stuff. But uh, traveling throughout the state this year, it's been such a really neat opportunity because I'll have MCVPS students who I've never met personally who come running up to me and, and are like, you know, hey, Mr. Freebird. And, and, you know, so, and I just saw one the other day at HPU. So we really have a unique opportunity to build relationships in a very different way. But we, we post every day a, um, a, just a, you know, kind of an introductory message so we can reach out that way and we can include kind of what's going on in our schools and in our family in that way. But also we contact at least once a week. Um, and I mean, most of my students and I would text daily. So there's a really unique opportunity to develop a different style of relationship with your students. And I, it, it's been very, uh, it, it's been very transformative for me to understand the difference in kind of those two roles as a teacher. But I, I'm so excited that 35,000 students have, have this opportunity to, to take AP or, or whatever it is. I, I, I feel very strongly about this program. So thank you for all thank your work, you. all y'all's work. And, and I get to meet you, like, finally. I see all your emails all the time. <laughs> 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 you know, the man behind the curtain. That's right. Right. Mr. Mr. McDevitt. Well, that's a great uh, testimony from uh, Freebird. I look forward to hearing it in Mandarin Chinese, uh, Freebird. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I get her here. A <laughs> couple of years. Some of us uh, are old enough to know that, to remember when we were starting this with a blank sheet of paper mm -hmm. uh, well over a decade ago and, and we had nothing so I, I I appreciate this annual report knowing that it has been growth in sometimes fits and spurts and looking at issues that you're doing today and uh, trying to look at those but I hear these questions and 
uh, around rigor and around relationships and uh, and then uh, we heard a presentation about relativity and uh, it's, it's right on target I must say that in those early days I, I you know I wondered if it would be where it is today in CVPS and uh, this can be a game changer for a life and uh, for a family and a community and I, I, I appreciate Elizabeth but it, it just it appears to me that she is so self uh, aware and so self even some ways self motivated self guided yes. uh, she could a very special person who could take that curricular and co-curricular and extracurricular and and all of that and put it into something that is making sense of, uh, for her journey and her path mm -hmm. uh, as she's look as she moves forward her presentation skills not many people would ask that question did I answer your question mm -hmm. and uh, and she wanted to know did I ask, answer your question and she talked about how this helped in those presentation skills. My question to you is, and maybe this is not to you, maybe it's to, uh, to uh, Janet or to someone else, uh, the on-site uh, process, uh, and uh, I, I, what I heard from you is that we, we might do it as part of the core in this system and we might do it as extra over here. Uh, I'm delighted we've got the 35,000. I'm just, I want to make sure that there's not some kid out there. Uh, how are we advocating? How are we helping? How are we guiding kids in the right direction where this is the right avenue? This is a, an opportunity uh, and that, that has nothing to do with their, uh, uh, with their zip code. It has to do with, with uh, perhaps the right guidance and making sure that we can, like I said, change a kid's life perhaps with, with adding uh, some of, just some opportunity like this. Uh, is, that, is that done at the school house in the school building? And how is it done in the school building? Are we, uh, are we waiting on the, the kid to come in and say, I'd like to take this course? I've got the list right here. But, uh, so I'm, I'm really just trying to make sure that there's not kids falling through the cracks out of omission. So I can tell you what we do, and if you don't mind talking about it from your local perspective, that'd be awesome. Um, uh, Dr. Murphy's team is school outreach. Her team works with the school identified contact. That's most often a guidance counselor. Sometimes it's um, a teacher or an assistant principal anyway um, to promote what's happening what the new courses are if you have trouble with like Elizabeth said cho students choosing between band and Spanish you know here's a way a solution and then we also go out to districts and recent meetings in different places to talk about it because it's a to me it's a constant process of a c continuous awareness now districts are it's locally controlled. Yeah. They locally decide how to implement it, who to put in it, and how to deploy it. Um, and it's um, some districts are wide open. Any course you want to take, feel free to sign up. And some control it, and that's about money. That's about the funding formula, yeah. Yeah. which is in the report. You can see the impact. I, yeah. I saw it, and I, I hoped you would elevate that because it's been an issue for a while. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, so it comes through the ADM allotments that they get. It doesn't, they don't write a check per se, but um, it's a projection model. So if X district is projected to have 200 students and they have 250, there is a reserve fund that covers that. The district does not get a bill. Um, if they are projected at 200 and only enroll 100, they do get a refund. They get a refund for the difference. So it's not money lost, it's not a, a gamble, but it is a three-year rolling projection. So it's in there, the dollar amounts are in there. And that was the change this board made. Uh, or with years, years, years ago, ago. yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a, the funding formula was put in, my understanding was it was crafted by a group of superintendents and then presented to you all for vote. Well, it seems to me that uh, an answer to our chair's question, what can we do, is one, just continue to look at that. One is the uh, teacher's pay, teacher pay that you elevated, and the other one is, is that formula and make sure that it's, 
it uh, is done so that there is uh, an incentive to have those kids exposed to uh, this opportunity. Right. Uh, and that's that shouldn't be a choice that has to be made out there at the school level that says how, how are we going to how are we going to pay for this when it's the right thing sure. for that kid right. okay. thank you mr. McDevitt dr. Colbert thank you for your time this morning excellent presentation there's lots of interest around the board table to make sure that I think I heard clearly um, that all students should um, know about this option that it is um, a, a um, terrific addition to what North Carolina public schools in the traditional setting can offer to students who want a robust, well-rounded, or just an opportunity to meet the criteria for graduation. So thank you. I think we have more questions um, that folks want to ask, but because of time, sure. um, I will um, ask that board members just speak with Dr. Colbert directly um, after, yes, you know, maybe fine. before lunch. We'll answer That's any great. questions you have about in any of the details anything about your local area thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you and thank you to your team thank thank you. yes they're great they're awesome <laughs> okay um board members we'll move on to eics2 and this is the um, lab school for the university of north carolina at charlotte and we're super excited about this dr hall um, i'll call you to the um, podium for a presentation <coughs> good morning chairman davis vice chairman duncan members of the board and the advisory I think building on the excitement around the innovation and discussion that just took place and what we were able to hear from Elizabeth and from Dr. Colbert and her team about the work that's taking place with our virtual schools, this is an opportunity to transition to some of the great work that's coming out from our UNC system office around the lab schools. Uh, with me today I have Dr. Albert DuPont who is the director for the UNC system office for their lab school project and uh, we have before you today a resolution that helps to introduce and hopefully bring on board a new lab school in the Charlotte Mecklenburg community. Uh, with UNC Charlotte, uh, slated to open in the fall of 2019. Uh, the school, which would be named uh, Niner University Elementary School, uh, would be a partnership between uh, the UNC uh, Charlotte uh, system as well as Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. And so with Dr. DuPont being here, I wanted him to be available to you to answer any questions that you might have for more specifics. But again, what you have before you is a resolution to uh, move forward from the Board of Governors uh, with the opening of this school slated for next fall. Questions from board members for Dr. DuPont or, or Dr. Hall? Super. Um, Dr. Hall, can you just um, remind the board of the process for getting a lab school approved so that we'll be clear on what has to happen if the resolution if that's before us for action on first read tomorrow is approved? Yes, ma'am. With your permission, I would actually ask if Dr. DuPont could present that because he's got a very deep knowledge of the work that's taken place the last couple of years and he can explain to you the good work that's taken place already across many of the LEAs and the work going forward for this particular request. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank Welcome. You thank you very much. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me to be here today. Um, the process occurred is that, and by statute, that uh, UNC Charlotte was to present a proposal to the Board of Governors Subcommittee on Laboratory Schools. That occurred on October 30th. Further, the legislation calls for once a resolution is approved by that subcommittee, that it be sent to the state superintendent of public education, at which point it would be given to the state board of education for uh, approval. And um, the law states that the board shall approve the particular resolution adopted by the Board of Governors Subcommittee on Laboratory Schools. I think the word there is shall. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, it <laughs> yes. Yes. It's interesting language. Yes, Ms. Ms. Willoughby. And just remind us, I, sure. I think I know where the other lab schools are, but um, just remind us of where the other ones are either operating or will operate. Absolutely. So our um, second year of operation right now, we have the ECU, East Carolina University Community School, operating in conjunction in Pitt County with ECU. We also have the Catamount School in its second year of operation, operating with Jackson County, and that's Western Carolina University. Um, this year we opened up in New Hanover County, um, D.C. Burgle Preparatory Academy, which was also its former name, but it is under jurisdiction of UNC Wilmington, and it opened up this year. It's the um, K-8 year-round, so they actually opened up July 18th, and they've been operating now for six months. The other two schools are in um, Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, and that is Appalachian, <laughs> Appalachian State University Academy at Middle Fork. 
and their K-5 school. And then lastly, we opened up in Rockingham County in Reedsville, and that is in conjunction with um, UNC Greensboro, and that is Mall Street Partnership School, two, three, four, five. And then number six right now, we have UNC, and then we have three other ones to actually, we're still working through three other ones to decide on the other three locations. And just, yep. if I a may, just up. a follow sure. up, um, not to foreshadow any coming discussions, but uh, this seems like a very good model for helping schools where you have, you know, a very um, well-structured way of providing assistance for those schools that, that perhaps need it. So just we'll put that out there. I know we don't have data yet from these schools and the effectiveness, but you know, this seems like a, a promising model. So as of the 20-day count of this year, we're now serving 1,055 of the most struggling students within the state of North Carolina because the law was geared towards schools that were either underperforming or students who were underperforming themselves. So we have um, over 1,000 students now that we're serving with the university right. support. The university in partnership with the local district. Yes. Dr. Oxendine. Thank you very much. Um, my question, I'm looking at the resolution. Um, could you give a thumbnail <coughs> description of the uh, perhaps the theme of it's it's nine or is that am I not a university nine or could you give me a kind of a sketch of the philosophy the theme the methodology so they're in the process of planning right now and in the co-planning part but um, the proposal basically you know one of the issues that we're having right now and this is not going to be anything new for this particular board is that students who are struggling many of the students are coming from poverty and coming from communities where they haven't been performing for a while. Um, and so whenever you're dealing with struggling students, especially right now, what we noticed in the university setting and as we've been doing and unpacking with, the, with, with all the schools is that students are really coming with a strong need for social emotional support. Um, the, the, the level of intense support that students in poverty and at low academics need are, are greatly. And so one of the main things we're working on is, and, and I would say this is true for all the schools, not only Niner University Elementary School, is um, around social emotional support, ensuring that all the interventions are in place for students who are coming from high concentrations of, of poverty as well as high concentrations of performance issues. Mm -hmm. And also um, getting back to some of the core basics, I think with, uh, around reading and mathematics. I think what makes this a really unique opportunity is that the universities and the research that comes with university and our faculty is actually at the table helping co to co-design this. And so um, all of the schools and at Nana University, again, looking at social emotional support, <coughs> trying to figure out the best methods and the best practices that are actually working for kids who have been struggling consistently for a number of years. Thank you. And it will be... Um a double plus for our schools and colleges of education to prepare our teachers, future teachers, to work in the low-performing settings. And so with it is high concentrations of students with needs, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mr. Duncan. First of all, I apologize. I'm burned with being a lawyer by profession, so I have a couple of technical questions to ask just to make sure no we problem, do this Mr. right. Um, one of the material states that uh, this does not meet the minimum threshold for the number of low performing schools in the district and I'm not intimately familiar with okay. how the lab school all the restrictions might be uh, does this does the board in passing it as is being requested need to make some form of an exception or state some form of a waiver as to why it would be appropriate for it still to serve as a lab school in order to meet the spirit and purpose of the law so the, the law actually provides that responsibility to the subcommittee on laboratory schools. And let me go back to the first iteration. I think we're through three iterations now of this law. If I, every year we're getting better and better in understanding how to actually put the intricacies of the law on it. Um, so originally the intention was eight, not nine, but eight schools were going to be performing in, were going to be placed in school districts that have 25% of their schools underperforming as identified by the state board. So basically DF, if 25% of your schools were DF schools, that would be where we want to place. What we noticed in the first year or so is that there are many school districts throughout the state that are quite large, Charlotte-Mecklenburg being one of them, 
that have a large pocket of students who are underperforming. And so what we were able to negotiate with the legislation was a what we call a waiver. And so the waiver would allow the subcommittee to actually place a lab school in a district that didn't meet that 25% threshold. And so um, we have three waivers right now. Um, UNC Charlotte requested one of them because Charlotte Mecklenburg CMS is not one of the um, underperforming districts. Um, New Hanover County with UNC Wilmington was not one of the 25% marker. And so that was the second waiver. And the third waiver was actually Rockingham um, because Rockingham is no longer considered a school district with 25% of its um, schools underperforming. And so the three waivers had to be considered by the subcommittee. And um, the law has a max of three waivers right now that allow us to participate in those three districts right now. So the waiver was granted to UNC Charlotte. That was one of the schools that, because of Charlotte Mech and the needs that they do have. And so the school is going to be cohabitating with a middle school who is under, um, under enrolled. And so there's plenty of space there for the elementary school to actually be there. So it's about a mile and a half, two miles away, which allows as, um, uh, Ms. Oxidon, right, spoke about in terms of having the undergraduates and graduate students actually visit because um, it's a much closer distance, about an hour and a half, um, a mile, mile and a half away. Well, agreeing with Dr. Oxendine's remarks about how helpful this could be for both students and our young educators, I think it's a wonderful thing. It'd be also be important if we can find ways for it to be in some of our most impacted areas that are not necessarily by our institutions of higher learning and I know that's a challenge when I say it but I mean we do have one for example um, as we've talked about before Appalachian State University right. commutes about 90 minutes um, to be able to get to Winston-Salem Forsyth um, Walkertown and so that that distance poses its own challenge but we are considering that as we're taking a look at all the entities that are out there with our um, 17, I think we have about um, 15, 17 institutions, but 15 of which have colleges or preparation programs. And the last question I have is, uh, I'm assuming, as I think I heard the law read that it was required for presentation to the superintendent for approval and for us, I, I'm assuming the superintendent's already received that presentation and approval. So I submitted to Dr. Hall who worked on behalf of the superintendent but he can speak to that. All right. And I'm more than happy to, in, you know, Chair White, in, in the future, if, if, if more detailed information, we have an evaluation that was just done, submitted, um, a report submitted to the um, Joint Oversight Committee. And so they're more than happy to come back for the, the board and, and make sure that you get whatever you need. Thank you so much, Dr. DuPont. One final question, Freebird. So, and I just wanted to, the regional team just went to DC Virgo and, and we were blown away. There, there's so many great things going on. I, I, I urge if you want to see just a, a model of kind of what this could be for the community. I mean, they had a community service center in the school that had uh, washers and dryers that, mm -hmm. that parents could come in and use. They had computer center there so parents could come in and work on uh, applications, job interviews, things like that. They also had people coming in doing cooking uh, and so parents could take part of that. They had an on-site doctor and dental facility where um, people would come in and volunteer times to come in as, I mean, it, it's, it was, we were blown away by the interconnectivity between the community and the school and, and the relationships there, so. And it has a lot a to do with model. the university resources, mm -hmm. right? The university brings a lot to a community. And, but but as, as Mr. McKinney said, um, if any of you would like to visit, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Eric. He knows how to reach me all the time. And, and I would be more than happy to schedule a visit for you um, at one of our lab schools. So thank you. Dr. DuPont, thank you so much for taking your time to be here with us this morning. Um, a lot of excitement at the board for the work that you're doing. Okay, uh, board members, let's move to EICS3, um, the Global Achievers School Review Panel decision. I wanted to let you know that yesterday, at the request of Global, Global Achievers School, which is one of our charter schools, a review panel convened to hear the school's appeal of our decision last month to revoke its charter. Um, the panel reviewed materials and heard presentations from both the Department of <clears throat> excuse me, the Department of Public Construction and from the school staff at Global Achievers. The panel did deliberate and we will present it, uh, the recommendation to the State Board tomorrow, December the 6th at, um, during the meeting. Okay. So then that moves us to um, EICS4. It's our um, only action item this month. <clears throat> 
well not this month but um, anyway so I'll call Dr. Hall for the discussion um, surrounding the approval of the innovative school district um, recommended school for 2019-2020 and Dr. Allen Ms. Allen With your permission, I will have uh, Superintendent Allen uh, start this conversation and do the presentation. Perfect, wonderful, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Davis and board members. We will begin our presentation this morning with a video. For those listening in, we're having a bit of technical difficulty. Ms. Allen, if, if you would go ahead and um, begin the rest of your presentation, if we can um, make the video work um, again with the magic behind the wall, uh, we'll do so. Are we close? He'll make the audio play. Okay. I understand we're going to play the audio. Um, we may not have this visual capacity. So the ISD was established to partner with local school districts and communities to create innovative conditions to accelerate student achievement and growth. It has been an absolute blessing for me to be a part of such a movement. And that's what this is. It's a movement to make sure that students across the state of North Carolina, no matter their background, are able to excel and achieve. All students can achieve, and we know that we cannot fail because we will fail students. So the first time that the Innovative School District approached the Roland community, people were fearful. They didn't know what to expect. Some of their thoughts was that we were coming to take over. It was really hard to get because here I am, I'm coming in, and the old perception, here comes somebody from the state. They're coming in to tell us, you know, we're here to help, we're here to do these things that are going to you know, potentially take over or take control. Um, I think when people first heard about it, uh, there was kind of this negative connotation that, you know, those states come in to take over because we're not doing it ourselves. Well, when the process first started, it was a feeling of fear because we were in danger of losing our schools. And of course, if a school is gone, it's like the neighborhood just dies out. And we didn't want that. As we went through the opportunities and the possibilities for the school, ISD coming on board, it really, Started making sense is maybe change this time. Maybe we need to make some changes in our way we're doing stuff. So let's take this as an opportunity to make it better so that our kids here in Rowling can see some progress and go forward with it. Instead of the newness being fearful, the newness is excitement. Once the questions got answered, I thought to myself, this is the place I want to be. Because I could see what ISD had in mind and all of the changes that they wanted for these students. And I wanted to be a part of the improvement in the school. I feel like ISD taking over has turned over a new leaf. I want my babies to have the same opportunities as a doctor's child that lives in Charlotte or a lawyer's child that lives in Wellington. Um, and sometimes our smaller communities, I feel like, get down on them. Like we're not, we're not going to exhale, and I feel like we can. And I feel like that's what's going to happen here. Our students are excited about school, they're excited about learning. Board. So it, made that, it makes that challenge a, a whole lot easier that you have a motivated student body that's, that's enthusiastic about change and willing to learn. You don't know unless you try. Oh, okay. And you can only be open to new ideas because we want to 
bring in the innovative ideas and strategies. We want to hear what's working across the United States, across North Carolina, so we want that here in our hometown. Give it a chance. Let the process work. I've seen you know, the parents and the educators in the community. They're our customers. We're here to serve them. And it's not about taking anything away. It's about empowering and lifting up those voices in a way that create the best conditions for, for success in the classroom. The sky's the limit. You know, it's the positive people coming in. It's the positive community. It's the positive parents. It's the positive teachers that encourage our students to be the best that they can be. So we did get an opportunity, of course, to see the video. But what I would ask the board members, if you would look, um, the presentation has is up on eBoard. So if you can follow along with our presentation um, based on from what's on eBoard. Uh, board members, the um, we have had a technical difficulty. The bulb in the projection system um, is out and won't be able to be replaced um, until we take a significant break. So I'll direct you to your iPad or laptop in front of you so that you can follow along with the materials that have been loaded on eBoard. Um, the video is embedded in the um, in the presentation um, that Ms. Allen will review. The collection for the bulb. Yes. So that video represented the voices in Robeson County at our first school, which is Southside Ashpole Elementary. Some of the voices that you heard um, were, of course, the school leader, the superintendent of schools, the mayor, parents, and other community leaders. Um, one additional is a pastor that has been very engaged in the community um, and working with the students there. And so when you have an opportunity, again, please review um, the video. The importance of that is that it is a community effort and that we have worked intentionally with the community there in Robinson County. Um, and you will see that now, of course, originally, when we went in initially, there was some trepidation. But after we've worked with them, you can see the excitement in that particular community. As we move through the slide that you have, the presentation that you have before you, we just want to reiterate the process of the qualifying schools. So the schools have to be in the lowest 5% of the schools in the prior year, includes all or parts of K through 5, did not exceed growth in at least one of the prior three school years and did not meet growth in at least one of the prior three school years, and did not adopt one of the established reform models in state statute should include rural and urban schools and we cannot engage in more than one school from a single LEA. In keeping consistent with what's written in the statute, there was a, a list of schools, 14 schools, and it was narrowed down to six. There were several evaluation factors that we considered. We evaluated student performance and growth data trends over the past three years reviewed most recent comprehensive needs assessment, conferred via phone and face-to-face -face with district superintendents and other district leadership, conducted school visits and engaged in discussions with school principals and other school district administrators, and we considered the plans and processes that were currently in place at schools to address performance gaps and barriers to success. All of this had to take place prior to our date of October 15th when we were required to make the recommendation and to inform the school districts of the recommendation. The next slide really shows you how we narrowed down throughout this process. Of course, we applied the additional criteria, which is where we came with the six schools. We analyzed the performance over the most recent three-year period. Internally, we met with the account our accountability department as well as engage with Dr. Barber's department in looking at the data and making sure that we convened internally um, with ISD as well as other departments in DPI. After that took place, we also conferred with district leadership and conducted school visits. So externally, as we met and talked about data, we met with different individuals in, different, in the districts 
And so based on the school where we went, we had those detailed conversations about the data. We also conferred with school board and county commissioners as we continued to narrow down, had public hearing and parent community input, and also made our final determination. As you look at the next slide, it shows you the six schools. What I want to make sure is understood is that we can only have five schools, of course, in the ISD per statute. And we already have one, which means that as we're narrowing down, we could not select all six schools. It was only possible for us to select four schools this year. And so if you will look at the next slide, you will see the four schools as we continue to narrow down. It was Carver Heights Elementary, Fairview Elementary, Hillcrest Elementary, and Williford Elementary. And so you can see the data for those schools. On this particular chart, you will notice that Carver Heights Elementary is the lowest performing in regards to data. Close behind is Williford Elementary School. And then you have Fairview and Hillcrest. As we talk about our engagement in the districts, you will be able to see as we started to narrow down, we were looking at what is actually taking place in the school for school turnaround um, to, as we continue to narrow down and make the best decision for the school that we would select for recommendation. The next slide shows you a four school comparison of the overall CNA. There are five areas, instructional excellence and alignment, leadership capacity, professional capacity, planning and operational effectiveness, families, and communities. There are four designations along this continuum, lacking, emerging, embedded, and leading, with lacking being the lowest on the list and leading being the highest. In these four schools, they all had a designation of either lacking or emerging. And so the chart provides that information to show where they all fell on this particular continuum. So at Carver Heights, all of the areas were lacking, except for family and communities, which was emerging. For Fairview, there were four lacking, two emerging, leadership capacity and families and communities. Hillcrest had all lackings in five areas, and Williford had three lackings and three emerging in the areas of leadership capacity, planning and operational effectiveness, families, and communities. Yes, uh, yes. Mr. Buxton. Just a point, point of clarification. Got lost on six to four. Okay. So is the criteria that brought us from six to four the school-wide on grade level? Yes, so the data that you see in the chart above, you'll see the six schools and look at the data, and as we continue to evaluate and narrow down, yes, it was the four here's, lowest here's problem. Problem. Yeah. Okay. This will just take a second. Which attachment is that? As I look at Gaston Mill, one one off, as an example, mm -hmm. and I look at where those students were mm -hmm. at eighth grade as they're about to move to high school, mm -hmm. down there. I'm looking at 7% proficiency in math for all students. I'm looking at Seven percent. Now looking under five percent for economic Looking at twenty-three percent in reading. So at the, at the end, as they're about to move on, where we've got these six students, we've got we've got numbers that make these look. I'm just I'm unclear why that one number is driving the narrative. And the one number that you're referring to is? It's the one that you referred us to, which is the overall grade level. Yes, yeah, so we have the grade level proficiency. We also have the average school performance score. If you, are you looking at the yeah, sixth chart? I'm, I'm and we also look at the school performance grades over the last three years. Okay. Does the CNA factor into that as well? So the, narrow the, the CNA has factored, and we looked at the CNA um, more deeply as we narrow down to the four schools, yes. And so that's why you'll see the chart that has the CNA for those four particular schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Ms. Willoughby. Follow up to that, I, I still am not clear. So because of the glaring number that um, Mr. Buxton just pointed out for Gaston Middle, 
how how did that one get dropped off the list? I, I still mm -hmm. maybe you felt like you got your answer. Yeah, I just I think when you, you know, just if you look at the overall number and the average performance score and the school performance, I mean, those three you got multiple measures. And so Gaston actually has by yes. Where we have kids, is they're moving on to the next. I think we're discomforted by all six schools, and that's why they're on the list. Yes. Um, and so, yes. And yes. so yes. the yes. And so the um, Gadsden actually has the highest score if you look at it, overall score out of all six of the schools. And I have one follow up if I may. Sure, Miss Willoughby. Um, the the rubric that you used, I suppose, um, when you looked when you show the four school comparison overall, CNA. When you looked at things like leadership capacity and Carver Heights and Hillcrest show lacking, are you talking about the principal? What do you, what's the leadership? So that's in regards to the comprehensive needs assessment. Right. Um, and so if you look at that particular area, which was all of that information was provided in detail, right. it's a pretty detailed um, document. Right. Um, and but so would you, what would you say is really driving the, the decision? When we look at emerging and lacking, mm -hmm. and you know, some, there is some subjectivity there when you make those assignments. Mm -hmm. um, so particularly for, for the leadership capacity, when, when we know what, how important that is to the success of a school, I'm just yes. curious about, in your opinion, would you say that it's so you look at the leadership of the school, of course the principal is including, uh, included in that, but leadership does not just stop at the principal. It's also the, admi the administration of the school. Um, and so what I would say in that particular area, and I don't have the, the actual summary in yeah, front Yeah, you of sent, me. we have all that. Mm -hmm. but um, yes. I'm just looking at kind of weighting that and wondering with those four, you know, why two of them show a little bit higher in that particular area. Yes, and so I, again, I don't have that document in front of me, but it does detail and outline why it is emerging or why it is lacking. And were you asking about a school in particular? I was asking about the two that will show that particular aspect as lacking, but that's that's fine. You can go on. But the question I think is, is what distinguished in the leadership capacity area lacking from emerging right. and there are two that say lacking there are two that have emerging what's what what's the divider I know we have the information I'm just I was asking for your opinion on that just right and I can provide that information to you later if it. that's you requested mm -hmm. no, I'm saying the specific information that you're saying what distinguished one school from another school no. yes are you I'm, I'm asking for point of clarification to my are you asking was there a rubric was there a, um, a breaking point if you were a level 19 you were a lacking if you were a level 20 that put you in the emerging okay, so block so what what was the what was the method or the um, the breaking point between lacking and emerging? Right. And I'm going to ask Dr. Silver there. to come up so that she can explain that to you because it's her department that's in charge of the CNAs I assume there is some subjectivity in it. I, there I, is, I, I mean, that's what it, my point okay. is. To, there is some subjectivity. I was just asking for sort of a, an opinion. Broad, I wasn't really, I know the data is all there. I got that. But is there a rubric? Okay. If you dig into CNAs. Okay. Let, let's let Dr. Sure. Silver address the questions. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Sure. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everyone. Chairman Davis, board members, colleagues, and all constituents we have with us today. So that particular rate, all the ratings are based on a rubric that we use. So it's not a cut score as you would think about it. So when we do a needs assessment, part of that is professional judgment and hearing from the school and collecting that data. So if you look at the rubric when you have an opportunity, we can certainly provide that to you. Leadership capacity looks at instructional monitoring. It looks at collaborative and distributed leadership. So we're looking at do teachers have opportunities to lead? And we're also looking at opportunities for different folks to have leadership roles. So it's not about, so when you think leadership capacity, I know the kind of our inclination is to think of just the principal. But the rubric looks at several aspects, which also include strategic planning and mission and vision. So those are really the core things you're looking at. What's the strategic plan or improvement plan say? What's the mission and vision? How does that factor into the work of the school, the instructional monitoring piece, and how that's factoring into improvement in the school, and then that distributed leadership piece. Okay. 
Any additional questions while we have her at the podium? Okay, back to you, Ms. Allen. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Silver. So as we continue to look at the presentation and we look at the individual schools, we look at those areas that we were just discussing, those five areas. And so under that, in the last presentation, I discussed areas that we saw while we were visiting the schools that showed that there was a school turnaround process in place and what were those actual act actionable items that we were able to see that was already in place and that were implemented. And that's what you will see. I will not read all of these because I did a detailed explanation in the last um, presentation, but it does show what were those actionable implemented strategies that are in place at those schools at the time of our visit and that was communicated to us. And Ms. Allen, just for clarification, your recommendation was based on um, improvement plans already in place at the time that you had to make the recommendation. Yes. Yes. And so as you'll see, there are inf there's information under each column on each of these slides that shows what were those areas, what were the conversations that we had with the districts. Also, of course, we did site visits, um, and we also <coughs> referenced, of course, the CNA. So the next slide actually talks about the engagement that the board requested that we do. Um, additional engagement in the community. And so I will discuss some of the meetings that we had an opportunity to engage in in the community since our last meeting. One was meeting with the mayor and city councilman. We had a great meeting with the mayor and city councilman. They had, uh, and the mayor pro tem, had many questions um, in regards to the innovative school district. What was communicated to us was that they were ready to see a change for Carver Heights Elementary School. And so there were many, um, inf there was information that they had that was incorrect. And so we were able to provide that information to them so they, they could see actually what is the innovative school district. Some of that included that it was a, an outside organization um, that was not attached to the State Board of Education. And so those are some of those questions that were, that were had um, by, the, by the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and the city commission. We also presented to the city commissioners at a meeting, um, which also went very well. There were a lot of questions um, to us as well, and we were able to communicate effectively. What does this process look like? What does it mean for the community? It's in a, a process where we're engaging with the community. We're not leaving the community out. This is the community school. And so we realize that we want to make sure that those individuals are involved in the process as well. After that meeting, we were also invited to present to a group of parents of Carver Heights Elementary. Again, the same thing transpired at that particular meeting. There were many questions. Um, parents had many concerns. And so we were able to have dialogue with the parents to answer some of the many questions that they had as well. We also met with Men Who Care of Goldsboro, the NAACP. We had community meetings and ongoing grassroots efforts with Carolina Can. Other meetings and outreach efforts that um, are being scheduled are with local pastors, um, talking to the media and other stakeholders. And so we realize that this is an ongoing process in engaging with the community, and so we will continue those efforts as well. Ms. Allen. Yes. Just a question, and perhaps um, because you were, um, had not joined our staff um, when we were working with Southside Ashpole and Robeson County, um, so perhaps Dr. Hall might better be, be, be better equipped to answer this question. Can you, Dr. Hall, is it fair to say that most of the um, bridge building and community efforts um, occurred in, in um, Roland after the school was selected, that that was when the true work began, getting all of those community stakeholders to the table to wrap its r arms around um, the, the efforts by the, by the Department of Public Instruction to turn the school around? Yes, ma'am, definitely. I mean, there was obvious, you know, no surprise to probably anybody in this room or 
anybody out there in the larger context of these discussions that we've been having across the state for the last 18 months that, you know, on occasion, I mean, there's, there's been definite, you know, concerns, pushback, questions, dialogue that has to be had. And that's where I think you see a shift once the decision was made in the situation of Southside Ashpole, we still continued. We didn't just step away because the board supported the decision here. What we did is actually took a more intentional focus on having we engage more deeply with pastors, community leaders, to help bridge the work that was going to be going forward. Because the fact of the matter is, as you know, Ms. Allen said, this has to be a community-led reform. If it's not, then it's us doing something to somebody versus doing something with somebody to build the capacity for the long-term change. And so we know that the conversations are tough, but to your point, Ms. White, absolutely there was a significant shift, but it was also a shift not only in the community, it was an intentional shift for the ISD to ensure that collaboration and engagement with the families, with the community leaders and others that we knew were gonna be there for the long haul, even after the five years when the ISD leaves. Thanks. Thanks for letting us interrupt. Any questions? Just uh, Madam Chair. to continue on a, a bit further with that point that, that you are making, Ms. White, or the question you're asking, Ms. White. Is there, could you discern whether the level of community engagement happened to be stronger in one school versus the other, either prior to the the school going into the schools. Uh, my question is, can you discern if there was long-term or some sustained effort by the community to be engaged in the schools, one versus one school versus another, in terms of strength, presence of the community? And just for clarification, are we talking about based on the schools last year that went through this process, or are we talking about the current? Well, any time you go out and, and talk with parents and communities and civic organizations. Is there any way you could um, discern whether, wow, this community's always been involved in this school versus not as much? You know, I think in fairness to the communities, I, I want to be careful not to generalize or right. place judgments or assumptions in place. Because from the time that we start to engage, of course, you're going to see an uptick in energy. You're going to see some passion. You're going to see things that come forward because these are critical conversations that have to be had. But um, I think in fairness to the parents and the communities, I think sometimes parents, everybody's engaged as much as they can be or you know, maybe know to be at that point in time, but when you create a forum for this type of dialogue and this type of engagement, it invites conversation that's important to be had, and I think that's what we've seen. And, and let me clarify my point. It's not to cast aspersions against communities. It's more effort, I suppose, on the part of the school the school to reach out into the community, to create robust parent involvement programs, for instance? I think it's obviously it's a goal for the ISD to ensure that we do that. Um, I think when we look at, you know, in some cases, the CNA helps to provide us some insight into what are the barriers that some schools may be facing. And so when we look at those barriers, it helps us to know also from an engagement standpoint, long term, once the decision's made, what are the things that we need to know up front that we need to be very intentional about doing to support the school for the long term? So. I think to your, to your question, Dr. Oxendine, I think we see significant engagement and we've been very fortunate and intentional about how do we maintain that engagement as you heard on the video earlier. Those voices are still at the table. They're still being very involved in the work that we do. And I think we're blessed to have you know, parents and families that are very you know, supportive and engaged in the process of their child's education. And that's what we would hope to see happen at every single school that we partner with and engage in. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ford, are Thank you here? Mr. Ford, do you have a question? Yeah. Madam Chair, uh, this is uh, Mr. Ford. May I ask you a question really quickly? Yes, please. So, uh, Dr. Hall, uh, Ms. Smith, thank you again for uh, coming in and presenting to us and uh, also for getting us those documents. Really, really encouraged to see uh, the public engagement piece, piece in particular. Happy that you got a chance to speak to all these individuals. All of them seem like super important. Uh, members of the community to engage with. I'm curious, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm curious, what was your sense uh, of their willingness to be involved in a more intimate or formal way in the ISD process? I ask that because, uh, you know, one of the concerns that I've had from the beginning is that, you know, um, the engagement be authentic in the sense that there's, there's an arrangement that involves some power sharing. Uh, where community stakeholders have the ability not just to be engaged as consultants in the process, but as constituents who really have a stake 
in the decision making process. So that could be anywhere from the operator, the design, implementation, or the evaluation. And so I wanted to know, whereas we can't force them to be involved, A, did they seem as if they were willing to be involved in a more uh, intimate level? Have you entertained the possibility of formalizing some of those provisions where, um, like I said, key decisions have to be run through them, where there's, you know, sharing of data and information, and that they're literally at the table as uh, equal parties in the decision? Because I think that may help to mitigate some of the tensions that you, that you spoke of. So, Mr. Ford, this is, uh, this is Dr. Hall. I'm going to ask Ms. Allen to elaborate on some of the work locally and what's been transpiring up to this point in her engagement with the community, because I think she can speak firsthand to the conversations that she's had with parents, families, and other stakeholders locally. But I think to your point, um, everything that you bring up is exactly what our goals would be for any engagement that we have in any school or any community. Um, I think, you know, the challenging part, and this goes back to the comment or conversation earlier with Ms. White, is that... I think once people know what the final plan is going forward, it helps them to know what role they play in that discussion. You know, if you're a parent who's trying to understand is a district, you know, going to be transitioning with this school into a different model or into a different, you know, engagement with the state, it helps them to understand. Those are the questions we definitely saw, you know, transpire at Southside Asheville. I think in the case of the conversations that Ms. Allen has had up to this point with the local community, I'm going to ask her to speak to that um, based on your question, Mr. Ford. So, Mr. Port, thanks for your question. As we've engaged uh, with the community, the majority of the conversations, again, as I said earlier, were clarification. What does this look like? What does it look like for our community? Um, we did have individuals to state after the decision is made, but because, of course, when we explain the process, the decision has not been made as of yet. And so we did hear individuals tell us after, if this decision is made, we do want to be on board on what's best for our students because there are students at Carver Heights and we want to be a part of it. So yes, there are also individuals in the community who have concerns. Um, it is operating in the unknown right now. And so they don't know what this will exactly look like because there is a process that takes place after the decision is made as well. And that's why there is more intentional work with the community because at this time you're going into the planning and there we do involve the community and I think Dr. Hall can attest to once that decision was made last year individuals from the community were brought to the table on many decisions for the school and so they did feel like they were invested that they were a part that they were being listened to the early conversations that we've done in the community that has been the field. We appreciate you taking the time to present to us. We appreciate you taking the time to explain to us. Um, and there are some hard questions. These are some hard conversations. Um, but we are willing, have been willing, to continue to work and to explain and to make sure that this is a process where we are engaging the community and we are working together. That is really important to us. And we maintain that as we go forth and working in the community. I, I guess I wonder, and, that, and that's encouraging to hear um, that people have been really inquisitive about the process. And, and granted, as you said, no decision has been made or been formalized. But I wonder if um, if it wouldn't be more profitable to kind of come in mind with to, to, to basically uh, offer a structural piece, right? So so that it's more than a a promise to consult folk uh, when decisions are being made, but really saying you know perhaps. Listen, we're going to construct an, a board, an advisory board, right? A formalized structural piece that allows individuals, if they so choose, to have a seat at the table uh, on a continual basis, you know, not just at the beginning, but throughout the, 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 the tenure of the relationship, um, so that if they so choose, it could assuage their conscience in knowing that, listen, nothing will take place without them being there because it's been not mandated, but it's been formalized it, within the structure of how things are going to operate. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm still kind of stewing on some of these things myself, but these are some of the thoughts that I've been having, and even we're talking with some folks in the community, that I think would, um, I think would go a long way in building that trust. Mr. Ford, this is Dr. Hall, and I appreciate your comments on that. I think one of the things that I would point to is that many of the voices that you heard at the beginning of today regarding the video are individuals that actually sat on the local community advisory board and were involved in the selection of the operator, even with Southside Ashpole. So we do value that. I think we have you know, 
part of any good work is about how do you continue to build on the foundation and continue to learn and grow from that work and look at how do you improve intentionality as we go forward. And I think what's important to kind of point out, you know, when we had our meeting last month and we started on some of these conversations and the feedback that the board provided, which I have to tell you we value. I think you're asking the right questions and it's helping us to think about the work ahead. At the same time, I also want to point out that the process that we've used now for the last two years is built on a process that we have used and we've tried to make sure that we stay to because we had a deadline of October 15th. And so we've managed to stick to that process that informs the recommendation that has come before you as a board. And as we go forward, I think the feedback that this board has provided since that time are things that we can consider as we continue to go forward and build this work out. Again, we're still at the starting point of this work. I think the good news that I see above all else is that while we've had four schools that we've been able to identify, you know, when we came to this consideration, we had to make a real hard decision. Do we come with four or do we come with the one that we identified as of October 15th that did not have a specific plan and strategy in place in our conversations? And in that conversation, we had to come back and really discern with the board what that recommendation is based on. Data informed, you know, comprehensive data school-wide is what got us to this point of looking at where the schools are at that period of consideration using that process which again replicates process we used last year we stood before the board and we recommended the one school because we could have again set all four but if we did that we would be negating what we saw with the other three districts and the efforts that they had made well before the september release of data for this school year already in place i want to give you know in this case carver heights and wayne county public schools credit we recognize that since october you know after that recommendation had been entered that there have been some changes at the school. We recognize that, acknowledge that, and we think that those are the kind of things that, you know, in hindsight, if we could have had that kind of work in place maybe well in advance, it'd be a different situation. But again, going back to the October 15th deadline that we had to come before the board in November, submit that information to the local boards by October 15th. We use the evidence, the information, and what was in place at that point in time to inform that decision. And so I'll make sure, it's, I think it's important to put that out there because again, things that come back as requests, and some of you have asked me different questions even about considerations for the future. We can look at that and we can continue to build this work out. But I think it's important that we understand what the process has been and that we have continued to stay with that process and want to make sure that we make this a data-informed decision. And again, whether it was going to be the four schools that came for recommendation, or in this case, the one, it's based on what we saw in place as of October 15th to ensure the success of the students in those schools. Thank you, Dr. Hong. Thank you, Ms. Alice. I apologize for mispronouncing your name earlier. Please forgive. Yeah. Ms. Cam okay, you're fine. <laughs> Ms. Kamnitz has a question. In this process of considering all this data and narrowing it down and down and down, obviously the two of you were deeply involved, but can you give us a sense of who else was involved in those discussions? What other, what other groups or people or yeah, expertise or whatever? So, the most obvious would be our division and accountability. You know, just like they run the rules and the process every year for the low performing school list, they use the business rules that are directly out of the statute to help run that same list of schools for the ISD. So we review that information with them to make sure that we have, again, a good strong understanding of the data and the information. And also pointing out that the data that we use, and a good example, like even the K-5 designation that came up last time, that's information that is actually entered by the local district into a system called EDI. So these are the data systems that we have to pull from to help really inform this process. So accountability is a good starting point for us when we look at that annual list of schools that qualifies. So their expertise and being involved in this work long-term and for many, many years with creating the local performing school list, even down to consulting and engaging with individuals like, you know, Dr. Silver, Dr. Barber's team, understanding their engagement and things that go into this process. So we definitely work with many professionals around this body of work. And, uh, you know, at the same time, go back to what the law requires when it comes down to getting that list of schools to qualify. Mr. Duncan. Thank you. I, I don't know if I'm assuming y'all are finished your presentation at this point. So I'm willing to wait till the end to make a comment. No, that's fine. You can go ahead. Okay. And point, my recommendation is still for Carver Heights Elementary School. Okay. Um, so I have several thoughts and I'm going to share them for better or for worse. Um, so let me start by saying <clears throat> I appreciate the work that's been done because <clears throat> I don't think you have an easy task. And I think the statute is the timeline of the statute, which I'll come back to, sets it up to make it essentially an extraordinarily difficult task and one that I'm not sure can be done with the type of fidelity and excellence that we all strive for for our students. So uh, that's sort of a starting point. 
my next starting point is um, I believe in Dr. Patrice Faison, and, um, and I have long-term evidence to believe in Dr. Patrice Faison, and, and I believe good things are on the cusp of happening at Carver Heights. Um, I believe in the staff because she believes in the staff, and she's had the chance to spend some time with the staff and understand the staff, and uh, she believes that she can turn that school around. I believe in the, the uh, staff of the Wayne County Schools and their commitment to this school. And I believe in the uh, school board members who believe very much in this school and for the betterment of the students in their county. And I believe in the community and how much they care about their schools. And I, I think we've all seen a lot of evidence of that. Uh, I also appreciate the fact that in this very difficult discussion, uh, Wayne County has advocated very strongly, which I would expect them to do for their students and for their schools, but they have not, to my observation, done it by way of attacking other schools that were under consideration, and that matters to me because it would have been tempting to get into a big comparative contest, and they have avoided doing that, at least around me, uh, or any information I've received, and I'm appreciative of that fact. So then that sort of leaves um, the question to ask is, what's in the best interest of the children of Wayne County who go to Carver Heights or to the children of the other five schools that were selected as the six final schools? What's in their best interest at this point? Uh, because after all, that's what we care about the most is we want our children to succeed. And the context has changed. Uh, and I, I say this in particular fairness to the staff. Uh, the context under the timelines that were dealt with where a decision had to be made, made in an extraordinarily short time deadline for what recommendation was to be made for one or more schools. In that timeline, I think the staff did what they could do within that timeline, but I don't think there's enough time there to do all that one would want to do. And I suspect staff under careful examination would say we would like more time to do more. Uh, and in the same time, as uh, has been observed, several of the other schools had already made some changes, uh, and Wayne County made its most significant changes, I believe, after the timeline of when the first recommendations came out. And so it's, it's it, the context we're talking about now is not the context, not the exact same context that was being, being dealt with by our staff as they looked uh, into possible selection of a school, and we just have to look at look at it through two different prisms. One prism is what our staff did. The other prism is where we are right this second. And where we are right this second causes me to come down and answer the question is what's in the best interest of children here uh, to two or three thoughts. Um, one of them is I believe we need to have meaningful discussions with our legislators about whether or not the timeline is right or whether or not this approach the way we have it situated right now is right. And I believe uh, that those conversations can be fruitful in some respects because I know some legislators who were involved with some of the, in some of the districts where some of the schools were selected when they saw the process and the timeline being so short were themselves concerned. Legislators who are supportive of this notion because they care about kids, but they themselves were nonetheless concerned about the timeline and how it worked. Uh, so I think that's one thing we need to do. I, I personally would like to have a better idea of, of what possibilities exist for a waiver under the legislation to see whether it can get further consideration before we actually select a school for this year. Um, I, I don't, I can't envision any operator coming in and doing anything better than have a North Carolina Principal of the Year who's a specialist in turning around schools running the school. It's, in, it's frankly inconceivable to me that we could get to a place where anybody could get to a better place for the interests of our students. And so in that light, you know, is there a possibility for a waiver? Because I need to say about the other five school districts, if we were to suddenly decide between today and tomorrow we're going to select one of the other five school districts because of the changes that have been made since that time, um, the word fairness is important to all of us. And I don't think that would be particularly fair. They would be completely blindsided. Uh, it would make uh, the job of Ms. Allen and Dr. Hall virtually impossible because the communities would be very resentful of being blindsided in that context. And it would make 
the work of the ISD, which whether one agrees with the ISD philosophically or not, it's a policy decision that's been made. And we, we all have to be committed to is we have students going to the schools, whatever selected, and we care, we care deeply about the success of those students. And so we don't want to blindside anybody or any community. So I think a question about whether or not a waiver uh, is, is conceivable is at least something that we ought to think about or get additional information on. And I'll say the last uh, thing is in terms of who operates the school, if we are compelled to have to go forward, make a selection, um, and if, for, if the majority of the board feels consistent with the recommendation made by the staff, that that school should be Carver Heights, then I can't imagine who the operator could possibly be better than Wayne County Schools with the staff that they put in place. Because I believe in that staff and I believe in what the work that they'll do. And so um, don't take this lightly. I mean, I know Wayne County would be the first to say they want better for their schools. And I think all of us feel that way for all the schools, all, all the schools that are on this list. And I don't mean the list of six, I mean a much broader list. We want better. Uh, I think we've motivated change with this and positive change in a lot of districts, and that's really a positive thing. So I think we try to need, need to try to look at the positives and at the end of this discussion find a way as what are we doing that's helping our kids? Because Lord knows that's what we all want to do. Thank you, Mr. Duncan, for those comments. Ms. Oxendine and then Ms. O Dr. Oxendine. What I would like to see say is basically this I, I would um, I would hope that the students at Carver Heights Elementary would be able to, very soon because I will I will go, I will be forward and say I will not vote for a waiver <clears throat> because I think a waiver is not in the personally this is I'm only one board member and this is my strong opinion strong thought about this is that um, a waiver is not in is not waiving something on behalf of, in my opinion, of, of students. I think a waiver is, to me, would be acquiescing to the political winds or acquiescing to the best interest or the wishes and whims of adults, not that of students. Now let me go back to my previous state, just 30 seconds ago. What I would hope for the students at Carver Heights is to enjoy some of the same changes that are in the YouTube <coughs> video that we, I'm sure that each one of us, each board member has had a chance and unfortunately those in the audience did not have that opportunity to see that video. But it brought tears to my eyes when I opened the YouTube a week ago and watched it in my family room. I live within 10 minutes, 10 miles of the school. And this is not about Southside Ashpole, it's about Carver Heights, but let me just talk about Southside Ashpole today. It's a very different school than it was a year ago. It is almost like a school that's not, it, perhaps not even um, geographically aligned with the public schools of Robinson County. It's a different place. It's truly a different place. And while we don't have the test results yet, you can walk in a school and know that good things are going on by walking in the lobby or walking in the office or go going in the cafeteria, talking to teachers, talking to the teacher assistants and spending time with, with the staff. And you, you feel something new and different and vibrant is happening in the school. That's what I wish for this school, for the students at Carver Heights elementary and I think it is a K-5 school or 3-5, I forget three five. the configuration of the kids, right? Okay, now let me go to something a little bit more concrete. I'm looking at the PowerPoint frames beginning, uh, I think it's the number 11 and it goes through each of the schools. Actional improvement plans, Carver Heights, and then you have a, the same frame for each of the other schools. Okay, I'm looking at three columns, folks. One column is teaching and learning, another column is support for student achievement, leadership capacity, professional capacity, planning operational effectiveness, families and communities. <coughs> Three of those columns, teaching, learning, very important. 
the heart of achievement. Professional capacity, the heart of continuous improvement for the educators. Planning and operational effectiveness gets at the skill sets of the lead, the principal. Three of those columns, colleagues, are empty. No data, no notations for Carver Heights Elementary. I mean, Carver Heights. The only one of the schools without noteworthy information in the columns. Now, I want to know why. Because if you look at Fairview, we have, well, planning and operational effectiveness is empty, but we do have noteworthy information in teaching and learning professional capacity. We do have, um, I know I'm taking up too much time, Hillcrest. We have noteworthy information in each of the columns. We have noteworthy information in each of the columns for Williford. We do not have information, noteworthy, we have no information in the in the PowerPoint frame, the columns for Carver Heights. Now maybe there's, there could be information to include today. I don't know. But all I can go by is what I'm looking before me today. Those are my comments. Mr. Buxton. Again, this is going to come to question. Um, what, what troubles me about this process is we set up a contest that no one wants to win. Yes. Rather than creating a scenario where districts are receiving supports that help them in schools are in trouble. And so rather than competing for opportunities to get additional resources, coaching, and supports, we are, we are happy when we don't get named as long as the great intervention. So I think in a perfect scenario, and I'm not going to hold this department or anyone to a perfect scenario, but we would have schools and districts needing support, and we'd, be, we'd begin to push in, deepen our involvement as a department, we'd send coaches, we might get to a point where we work with other partners, nonprofit and for profit, school turnaround partners that might support this. And then we might get to a point where we say, nothing's working, we're going to send it to someone and, and that to me makes sense, and I'm not opposed to places where charter operators no. schools no. and let me be clear about that what's what I'm trying to figure out here then is the operator becomes really important discussion and if you go to slide just so we can anchor this 17 you've got four kind of key points about why car I looked at the data the disaggregate data that you sent and with maybe one exception we've got in all these schools. And we've got some significant cliffs that some of our schools are falling off our kids in all these schools. That's one. In the comprehensive needs assessment, as I read through those, I could make a pretty good argument for all these schools. And when I look at what Dr. Oxendine referenced, with all due respect, the classic response of a low-performing school is to throw you 50 things that they're doing. And it's generally the biggest problem they have because there's no focus and no prioritization. So I, I, don't, I, I still read into this. There are ideas here, but based on the data and the comprehensive needs assessments, we've got four, six places that need a lot of support. So what I'm left with, and this is my question, is if I've got six places, you give us four places that all could use support plausibly, then the operator decision becomes critical. Because some of these would be better with UNC Charlotte as the operator, some not literally because of location, but some of these would be better with a charter operator, depending on the quality of the operator. Someone would be better with the district or some similarly situated partner as the operator. But I might pick a different school depending on the operator that we think is in play. And so I'd like to understand where we are on the operator because I think given what's happened in uh, Wayne County that that Mr. Duncan there are reasons why a charter operator becomes difficult with a principal who's coming to others. So I just help me understand what are some of our choices. So you're speaking to my passion and this goes back to the original vision of where we wanted to see the ISD go is that 
how do we have multiple options around what an operator could be? Because the good news is, is our legislation did give us pretty broad range by referring to it as an entity. It doesn't say it has to be a CMO, an EMO, or any particular operator model. Uh, we are working right now with the General Assembly while they are in session to look at other innovative options that we can try to embed. Because I agree with you. I mean, context is important. Resources are important. Capacity is important. And if we can look at ways that we can design, going back to why we even went to trying to change the name from what it was to being the innovative school district, was trying to think outside the box and make it based on the context of what's happening in that community, in that school, in that district, and really empower the things that are strong and build on the momentum that we can take forward to do the best thing for students. Back to you know, Vice Chairman Duncan's point. We are trying to make sure that we make an, you know, a decision based on the best interest of kids. We wrestle with that quite often when we get to this point because we do want to see a school, and in this case, we have Wayne County. They've taken great steps since the recommendation has been entered. Again, I appreciate that. Of course, we're stuck now between the situation of how do we not lose the momentum that's taking place in that school right now, enabling that momentum to continue, and look at how does that come back to an operator model that makes the most sense for the context of Wayne County, and be able to build some partnerships that go back again to our original values. How do we partner to create the right conditions, or in this case, innovative conditions for the changes we want long term? So I think this is part of the body of work that we have to continue to build, to your point, Mr. Buxton. But I think you also find from the department, the team that's in place doing this work, we're committed to those same ideas and trying to see how do we bridge that work between what the ISD can do, what we can do with SNL and some of the new flexibilities afforded, and some of the investments that we can make in competitive grants long term for some of our CSI schools, and even bridging that to some of the regional work that you know, Dr. Petrie Martin, her team's going to be doing on the local level to provide those type of localized supports. Did I answer your question in a very broad way? In a very broad way. <laughs> so, Dr. Hall, for clarity. Yes, ma'am. The wording of the statute, can an individual LEA apply to be an operator as the law is currently written? It would be very, very difficult without some adjustments or amendments to the law. And I don't want to speak for, for counsel, but I think there are some potential barriers. And we've entered some requests to the General Assembly to provide for some technical corrections that would afford the kind of flexibility that would be needed to ensure something like this. Because you get into some very complicated models, correct? I mean, in one case, if you have the LEA locally serving as the operator, you know, based on the way the statute is written now, you have to look at some of the employment relationships. You've got to look at what do you do with some of the services that an LEA would provide? You know, there's just some things that, that become some nuances that we would want to get clarity in the technical corrections that have been submitted. So, Mr. A little more specificity on that. I know you don't want to do this, but I'm going to ask you. Uh, the bill's public. I mean, the bill's been Sorry. introduced, and it's, uh, it's public. The technical corrections bill that would allow an LEA to be the operator. Um, help me through the sequential order then relative to the decision we're, we're faced with right now and how, uh, how that would happen. I, I, you know, this timeline, and I, I heard in your voice you said, given the October 15th uh, uh, a deadline we had, you said that at least 10 times. And uh, so I don't want to read anything uh, in there that you didn't mean to say, but I heard you say clearly that that's an aggressive timeline from six weeks to do all the analysis and deadlines and all the research and Matt, Matt, sure, Matt, jump Matt, in. Yes. I'm going to just say one other thing. I believe Wayne County during that time also missed about, I don't know, 10 days of school because of the hurricane. And so that's another factor sure. this year. Yeah. Sorry. So I, I, I'm, I'm saying that because you know, we're in a very short period of time. We've gone from a, an announcement in August, September. September, September of the six schools at that time, I think, to four, to one, to where we are today, and we have a pending legislation uh, that's going to move sometime in the next few days. That impacts this greatly, particularly as it relates to what our vice chair. Uh, commented upon a while ago. I, I just want to make sure that what would be the sequential order and is there an option to uh, to combine some of those decisions? So I think options are important. I think there are some options and I think to the point, you know, when I say the October 15th deadline, 
The reason I specify that date and time is because I want the board to understand that with the information that we had, and as I recognize and I appreciate you know, I Vice agree. Chairman saying, there were changes that were made after the recommendation was entered. Hindsight, we've had a couple years here of looking at data trends and stuff, so I don't want us to just stay focused on that few weeks of time that we looked at, because we do look at trend data and to see what's been happening with schools over the course of the last few years. Um, so I don't want to lose sight of that point, but I think to your question more specifically around timeline and where do we go from here, we obviously need to see how the General Assembly takes up the technical corrections that have been considered and when asked, you know, any and all support <coughs> to try to move those forward where we can. The way the statute reads right now is that the decision is by December 15th for the State Board of Education to make a decision on the selection or not of the school. And then we could move in because in statute as well right now, January 15th is when the board may select an operator and have until February 15th to shall select an operator. And so the operator selection piece does not happen still for a little bit. We have some time. Not a lot of time, but, but we have some time. But then I, I think I hear you saying that we cannot, that there's not an option to combine the two decisions. Because we have a December 15th deadline to I choose I understand your question school. more specifically now. You're saying being able to make a decision on the selection and the operator selection at the same time. Yes. Probably not the way the process stands right now, because I think part of the process that we would want to see, back to Mr. Buxton's point, is understanding, okay, if a selection is made based on the criteria, that selection is made, and we would want to see, you know, how does the plan match up with what we would want to see for a school in comparison to other operators and make sure that, again, we're making the right match. And in this case, if it's the local board, we would want to support that and move that, that process forward and not lose any time for the rest of this year since work's already taken place. But uh, as it stands now, I don't see a way, unless the General Assembly makes a change between now and before December 15th, that's final, could a decision be merged one and the same? M Madam Chair, just to yeah. clarify some, since sure. you referenced, I want to be clear. What I'm saying is I think the selection of the school and the type of operator go hand in hand yeah. versus you're selecting a school and then we'll kind of see which operator. There are schools here that I would say would be better for a charter operator than others and vice versa. So I, I think it's a context, as okay. you named. I just want to be clear. That's, I appreciate that's, that clarity. And, and just for a point of clarification, um, last year during the operator selection process, we took those applicants and allowed an outside entity to evaluate um, the potential effectiveness. And I, if correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Hall, we have had um, that um, that request for proposal has already gone out, and we have operators who have already applied or submitted. Um, information to be an operator for this year so to protect the integrity of the process that was put in place last year I think it would only be fair for the board to look at all potential operators on the same table because we requested a lot of data to make the selection of the school I think we should give ourselves the latitude to evaluate any operator who deems themselves appropriate themselves appropriate to be an operator in this situation point of clarity so we have had submissions for consideration as an operator. We've had notice of intents come in, yes. 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 And we did uh, we did change and update the timeline because of where we're at in the selection process right now. For this. Those are specific for Carter Heights. These are specific notice of intents that came in after the September release of schools. So. For each of those, or for Carter Heights, it's just general notice of intents to submit an application okay. to be Thank an operator. Thank you. Board members, do you have any other questions for our team this morning? Lots of them. <laughs> Lo lots of them. Well, my other my other committee chairs may uh, may begin throwing and shooting darts at me if we. Um, but I want to, I want to give everyone the opportunity to uh, support this them. One's, this one's we, important. We have one little. Did you hear me say we? We have one little statement of, of concern about the. Uh, ISD, okay. And this is not just ISD. I'm holding in my hands, as you can see. Now, I didn't go out to get this. It happened to come to me. Okay. This Senate bill here, and it's on the floor. And that is that the there's a change being proposed to it. Right. And the proposed changes to the ISD and S Senate Bill 469 would require regardless that the school would be shut down if it is not successful at the end of five years oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and 
so I don't know, and, and I have it all here in case somebody wants to yeah. And if I can speak to that one? Yes. Dr. Hall, please, please. Sure where that correction <laughs> please. came from. And we did actually work with uh, Cecilia to ask that that be amended because we're not quite sure where that piece of the request came from. Our request was very specific to the local school board being able to serve as the operator. Well, it says regardless to the operator. Yeah. 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 It, I, and I can mm -hmm. hear what you're saying, but I can just tell you that this department, we did not ask for that right. particular request. Stephen. Maybe the superintendent. Further questions? It's a concern. Okay, well, we'll, um, we'll conclude the discussion for today, and I do believe that um, because in the interest of time, we are going to take a short break. Yes, we um, are. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break to give our team a chance to uh, fix the projector and for all of us to take a breath. Dr. So we'll be back at 1210. Wants to talk. It's out there. Engage us.
All right, please take your seats. We are uh, back in session. Uh, given that the hour is 12:15, and by our schedule, we should we are just a tad behind. Uh, so we we are we are going to uh, adapt our schedule slightly in that um, for lunch. Uh, we'll take about a 20-minute break, have a chance to go get lunch, bring it back in, and then we're going to turn lunch into a working session in order to keep moving forward. And that also gives our audience and staff a chance to go grab something, bring it back, however you can. But we're going to need to uh, press on through uh, some of that lunch period. Um, and then I'd ask for all presenters and, and us colleagues to be mindful of the schedule that we're on, and let's have a good, healthy discussion like we just concluded, but let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's pick up the pace a bit in order to finish before midnight. Um, so now I'll turn back to uh, Ms. White for the rest of the EICS committee work. Thank you, Chair Davis. Uh, we have before us EICS 5, and this is the approval of the application timeline process for the Charter School Program grant. And um, Dr. Dave Machado, Mr. Dave Machado is going to be before us um, explaining that process. <laughs> and apparently Siri has joined as well. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. White. I am Dave Michelle, the Director of the Office of Charter School, and this is Jay Whalen, one of our consultants in the office that has been heading up this project since the grant has been uh, approved. And I really appreciate the ability to come before you with the exciting news for this grant, and we haven't had a chance to talk to you about the details of the grant. Um, there were eight grants that were uh, federal grants that were given this year, and North Carolina was one of the eight that were given, and we actually had the fourth highest score in, uh, in, in the process. Right. The, uh, the name of the program is ACCESS. You'll be hearing that a lot during this presentation, and it stands for Advanced advancing charter collaboration and excellence for student success and the whole purpose of the funding of this grant is to increase the economically disadvantaged population of charter schools which I know we all talk about and, and work really hard to try to do the uh, the grant is a five-year grant 26.6 million dollars and the major priority is to fund the sub grants to our schools out in the field and with this grant there is four additional positions that have been funded to implement and to monitor the grant. I don't have a hard time with this one, sorry. There's four types of grants that will be, uh, sub-grants that will be approved. The four are planning and implementation. That is for a charter school that is either in their planning year or in the first three years. And you can see uh, year ones through five, the number of grants that will be awarded in the uh, maximum amount that can be awarded. The implementation only is a charter school that is in its first three years of existence. Expansion is a high quality charter school that wants to expand its enrollment so it can expand its economic disadvantaged population. And then replication is a high quality charter school that has a high EDS population that wants to replicate or copy and put in another school in another area. It's really important that for the first three sub-grants, if you want, in order to even qualify for that grant, you must uh, agree to do, any, do a weighted lottery where you give preference to your EDS population, that you offer transportation, and that you have a comprehensive lunch program. If you're a replication school, you're already uh, serving that population, and we know you know how to uh, do that. So that does very exciting news. These are the... Uh, what an applicant must provide to even be considered. Uh, and if you'll just look at, uh, like I've already talked about the uh, weighted lottery and everything, and part of this is if a school wants to 
uh, come to us with an application, they must also have a school closure plan. If a school were to close, which we never like to talk about, we want to have that. If they're going to fund this through this grant, that they give us a, a plan of how they're going to get these kids back into a traditional public school or another school. Oops. Okay, if, uh, if you want to expand or replicate, again, you must have data showing that you have been a high quality charter school. And a high quality charter school is a school that has a comprehensive score, proficiency score of an A or a B, and has met or exceeded growth two of the last three years. And uh, they also, we also will give priority preference for the subgrant because this is a competitive subgrant. If you are currently serving a ED, high DEDS population, you're a Title I school, your graduation rate is higher than the state average, uh, are you, um, and your subgroup data is above state level, you will get extra points for, uh, for in your application. I want to quickly talk about the North Carolina Access Fellows Program. This is a, pr this is a feature of this grant that was put into the grant. And when we were approved, the <coughs> person from the Department of Education uh, called me and said, I was specifically asked to be your consultant for North Carolina because of this uh, fellows program. And we feel like this fellows program is going to uh, do a great job as far as sharing best practices, not only amongst <coughs> this group, but amongst the charter school community and th throughout the traditional public school uh, spectrum too. It is, it is a very high intense professional development program where at the end of the five years we have, we'll have created a community of 100 charter school leaders that have demonstrated and have developed best practices, again, that we can share in the community. The fellows <coughs> program will consist of a four-day fellows institute in the fall. We're talking to NCAT and Cullowy right now about hosting that course. A two-day policy summit in the spring. 12 PLC meetings, four in person, eight virtual. Every one of our fellows program, the fellows, people that are qualified for the fellows program will be the leaders of the schools, obviously, that get this grant. Um, they must present at either a state conference or a national conference to, to meet the requirements of it. And they must also uh, host some sort of collaboration meeting, and they need to provide mentorship and development to future fellows. So again, we really feel like this is a strong way to uh, strengthen the quality of our charter school leaders. The timeline which we're asking that you will uh, approve in January of uh, 15 is when we're asking for the uh, request for application to be posted on our website. January through March, our excess team will be uh, doing trainings with our schools interested in the, in the grant, very similar to what we do when, uh, uh, during the charter school new application processes where we hold uh, trainings throughout the state. By February 15th, we need our, the letters <coughs> of intent, and by March 31st, all applications are due. April through May, we'll be reviewing the uh, applications, and then our office and the team will make a recommendation to the Charter School Advisory Board. The, Ch the Charter School Advisory Board will then make a recommendation to you, the State Board of Ed, and on your June meeting, we're going to ask that you approve the subgrant awards. And then in July, we'll do our orientation for the people that have been approved and uh, start dispersing money in July. And at, in August will be the end of the period. And we will do that again every year. That is the timeline that we hope to uh, keep. All right, this is the application process that we're also asking that you will uh, approve. And it goes over everything that's going to be in the application <laughs> that is required before we'll even look at it. And again, you will be the ultimate first, uh, body that approves these subgrants based on CSAB recommendation. And this is the rubric that we are going to use to determine if they qualify. It's uh, a very objective rubric. They must. Uh, score up to certain points in uh, this rubric, and they have to have score at least an 80 points to be awarded uh, the grant. So I could talk about this all day because we're extremely excited about <laughs> the ability for this money to go out to lower the barriers for the economically disadvantaged 
families to get into our charter schools, but Chairman Davis says be quick. <laughs> Any questions? Questions from board members. Well, we're, um, Mr. Machado, we're thrilled about the grant, $26.5 um, million, and um, the impact that this will have as we try to include and recruit uh, more low-income low students to our charter school programs. Thank you for the process that you developed in order to make those applications um, be considered fairly. Thanks so much. I, I want to call you with some comments, so that's okay. Excuse me? I, I want to call you with some comments. I, I, there's okay. no need taking up the time, but this goes back. Thank you. Um, EICS 6 is um, Moore Montessori's application um, to amend or its request to amend its charter to include a weighted lottery. And um, Mr. Machado. Moore Montessori School is in its first year of existence in Moore County. It is a Montessori school. Uh, they are asking to change their charter to do a weighted lottery. I think you're going to start seeing a lot of these amendments coming across because of this grant. Uh, Montessori, uh, more Montessori also ha already has a transportation program and a lunch program, and they were awarded the S a CSP grant on a school level. So this is a, one of our very best brand new schools. So we're happy to advocate for this uh, amendment. First of many we have. Thank you. Can I ask one question on that? It's yes. Just definite. What does weighted lottery mean? Is there a definition out there for that? Great question, Ms. Duncan. I'm sorry. Um, a weighted lottery for uh, uh, through General Assembly statute allows our charter schools to give enrollment preference to economically disadvantaged families. That's Thank the you. only uh, subgroup that they can give preference to. Thank you. Get some higher up on the list for selection. Terrific. Okay, and then um, EICS 7 is the restart application submission for Wayne County Public Schools, and Dr. James Ellerby will be before us to present. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, and members of the board. I'm here to present to you the application for a restart submitted by Wayne County Schools, which is Carver Heights Elementary School. I do want to point out on the application uh, there was a mistake with the uh, data as far as the school performance growth score and those numbers were changed from uh, 72.6 to 29 um, for the year of 2015-2016, 2016-17. The score uh, was listed as 56.8 and the actual score is 31 and as far as 2017 and 2018 the score was listed at 59.8 and it's 27 and it's probably just the overlook in the columns but the data from accountability reveals that those are the actual numbers uh, that go with that so I submit the application to you for discussion at this December board meeting are there any questions any questions from board members about this application Okay. Thank you. Um, board members, we're going to, if, if you would allow, um, we're going to move the um, report on for the um, ISD for the Joint Legislative Education Oversight Committee. We're going to move that to tomorrow, um, if, if that's okay. Yeah, without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chair. We are done with our committee uh, discussion <laughs> this morning. I'm sure you're much relieved, Ms. White. Yes. It might be Christmas Eve. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, thank you, Ms. White. We'll now proceed to the Student Learning and Achievement Committee, and I'll call on that committee chair, Mr. Buxton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have, uh, you only gave me one agenda item last time, which I appreciated, but now you're, you're loading me up. Prime time. Um, right. We're going to. Wait, don't or we are? No. Don't do it now. Okay. I'm calling an audible here, Mr. Chairman. We're not going to, we're going to potentially move up one of our, or are we going to keep it where it is? We will. Okay. So we're going to start out with SLA 1. This is an action on first read report to the North Carolina General Assembly on broadened access to advanced courses. Uh, Coltrane, please come up. I would just, commend to the board not only the report which you saw and you'll and the data but also I think you'll see some attention to 
some of the equity issues we talked about at our planning meeting, some of the degrees to which we are uh, moving resources to address some of those equity issues. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, and I have multiple items this morning, so I will um, uh, move quickly, um, but with attention um, to detail. So today, um, in front of you, you have our, um, the actual report that is posted on eBoard. And so our goal today is to really just provide you an overview of the report, um, like Mr. Buxton shared, and, and kind of bring out some highlights. We also have Kathleen with us, whom you all have, many of you have met over the years from College Board, and, um, and she will also be presenting um, uh, the information about the partnership. So just, I wanted to give a little bit of background for especially our new board members, um, uh, just to, to help you understand kind of where this is coming from. Um, all of this work is specifically tied um, to legislation that was passed about five years ago, four to five years ago. Um, and the idea is that the goal is to increase access and successful participation in advanced coursework in our school. And so advanced coursework is defined in legislation as a, for, the, for this purpose as AP, IB, and Cambridge courses. And this morning you actually heard from one of our IB students and that was, that was lovely, for, it was a great start for, for today. Um, the, the goals of this legislation um, is really, from our perspective, is kind of threefold. And, and, I, and how I wanna talk about it with you today is really connecting to your overall mission, but also kind of the conversations we've been having the last couple of years about equity and excellence. So the first one is to build capacity for success. Um, and so the primary kind of driver of that work is with the AP partnership, which Kathleen's going to be discussing with you through College Board um, as our um, uh, contracted uh, partner. Um, and that really focuses on teacher professional development and really building capacity in our school districts. Because as we know, it's not just about, hey, we're gonna offer this course, it's about preparation, it's about um, understanding how to most effectively work with our students with this rigorous content, and also building the structure systematically to, to really move that forward. The second piece that really speaks to us is that it ensures access. So prior to this legislation, we did have access for our low-income students when it comes, came to funding for the test. Because the tests do, on average, if you were to look, it's about 100 bucks, give or take. Um, and uh, so for our low-income students, we had traditionally applied to the federal government with their grant to cover those students. But we did have middle income and our other students who were not necessarily able to access that. I know my dad, being middle income, said, hey, you already got accepted into Carolina. They're going to take two. Pick the two you're going to pass. We're not going to just keep spending you know, th that cash. So what's lovely is that this legislation does afford for every student who is enrolled in one of those courses to take the exam free of charge. Um, the department uh, processes those invoices for our schools. And the third piece really speaks to the idea of supporting equity and excellence in our schools and in our districts. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. The idea is that we wanna, of course, continue to um, support success in this, these, these rigorous courses, but also <coughs> ensure, again, access capacity um, for our students. And you heard our Elizabeth so finally talk about that this morning. It is tied very nicely with your strategic plan as well. We are grateful for the legislation, but we were already on that path um, uh, pr prior to that. And so it just continues to synergize with your goals of ensuring every student is prepared for post-secondary um, education as well as personalized education. Um, so just briefly to talk about the partnership, there is targeted district support through the contract where we work with, where College Board works with low performing districts um, in, in different areas. They help provide technical assistance, Kathleen's gonna go through this deeply with you, and intentional professional development. So they have a team that works with districts, goes in, does classroom walks around the district, they work with leadership to talk about how do you prepare students, how do you build rigor K-6, and starting in middle school in particular, and then of course we want obviously to be thinking about that K-12 
um, starting in kindergarten as well. So that idea, there's also incredible professional development. You know, we can't make change without that and without supporting our teachers and what they do. And so Kathleen will talk a little bit about that with you. Then the other piece that we really felt was very important with this legislation and with this contract was really then to do statewide support because it's not just about our low performing districts, but across the state um, we had needs. And so one of the key pieces that we've worked in, and we're probably really unique in that across the country, um, is that we want to provide opportunities for every district. And so we do statewide professional development as well, um, College Board does, as well as offering mentorship programs to help teachers who may be a beginning teacher or maybe not used to in, in AP, as well as institute trainings for every school district um, around uh, in our state. And so that's very, so that we're seeing great support. Um, and this past year, we actually got an increase from 1.5 to 2.15 million for that contract. So we continue to build that work. Just to let, let you know, um, in the report, we report how we, this past year, um, spent over $14 million for these test fees. Um, that's an interesting day when I sign that invoice for finance. <laughs> Every now and then, I'm always, uh, stunned by that, uh, but, but needless to say, it's such a great service. We get notes from families. Um, of course, I always refer them to the General Assembly to thank as well, but we, we do get a lot of families and students who say what a great difference this makes for them to be able to, to not have this to be a burden um, for our um, students uh, and, and their families. And you know, our state does a great job with that, with Career and College Promise as well, with access and dual enrollment. And so it's just incredible to see, to see the support we give for all the opportunities for our students to really access college level work um, while in high school. Then the key other piece that we've been working on is really increasing course availability. Uh, Kathleen in particular, and as well as Beth, who is a part of our team here um, at DPI, and looking at AP and IB in Cambridge as well, how are we increasing courses locally, building that capacity? And then VPS, this is beautiful for me in this presentation, talked to you this morning with Elizabeth, but also with their report, about how they also really provide a clear link to be, um, to be able to provide opportunities for access for, for 19, actually, of the more common v, um, AP courses. We also have the North Carolina School of Science and Math, who has partnerships, um, especially in some of our rural areas, in really developing um, AP um, co-teaching opportunities, um, as well as cope with, actually, more cohort approach which works well for, for some of our schools. So we have, um, we're build, continuing to build that infrastructure to ensure access um, in all ports, parts of our state that are not dependent on, on address. And then the equity and excellence piece. For those of you that have been with us the last several years, you've heard of some of the excellent um, work our teachers and students are doing in our schools. And so I do wanna highlight this. Um, we continue, North Carolina, to outpace the nation when it comes especially for our Hispanic students this past year um, for participation and performance. Um, every uh, year previous, we also were that with our black exam takers, but this year we had a slight, um, uh, did not increase as much as we usually do. So with our Hispanic exam takers, this year we had 6.3 compared to the 4.5% increase. Um, and overall growth since this started with our Hispanic exam takers and their participation is 73.2 points. Mm -hmm. You all remember a couple of years ago, I think I may have actually done a happy dance here in front of you. <laughs> uh, we were so excited when we outpaced the nation in double digits. And so we continued to do that, um, not at at those high rates, um, but, but definitely still a, a great success. With our black AP exam takers, we did have a slight decrease this year, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in just a moment, but still since 14, um, we're, we've seen a 50.3 point um, increase since 2014. And so when we look at this, as well as our numbers in enrollment, we continue to have an overall close to 9% growth in our enrollment in AP courses. We did see a slight 0.9% decrease. And so when Beth and I were talking and we were talking to the committee with Mr. Buxton as well, um, we were discussing about how both of these slight decreases really relates very well to your presentation with REI um, last couple of months, last month, last month, time is confusing mm -hmm. my head. 
uh, recently, <laughs> um, the idea of groundwater. I feel like what we have done is remove the, the, the low hanging fruit. We remove the immediate barriers. We said, hey, we're gonna get you teacher PD. We're gonna get you free tests. We're gonna get you more access. And we've done that. And now it's that deeper, harder work of addressing some of those systemic, harder, higher fruit, right? Higher hanging fruit of that deeper work. And so, yes, we have seen incredible increases. I mean, 73.2% in our Hispanics, 50.3% with our black students. But now we're not seeing those huge gains. And so what do we have to do is we have to really think more deeply look more closely at what we're doing and really partner with all education, right? Like we all have been discussing on how to continue making those growths to get proportional um, representation and, and participation with that. Kathleen is gonna talk to you about our exam data, so I'm gonna skip this mm -hmm. um, for time. Um, but going back to the success, because it's always so important when we think about policies, what's working, and then we can look at what's not, what we have to keep doing. So our, clearly in the investment in teacher professional development and the technical assistance is making a difference. We wouldn't be seeing these huge gains with our success with the exams, nor with our participation in the double digits across the board. The mindset shift, we're really moving towards that idea of of not about address, but really, okay, access, right? And really helping people think that, you know, remove the barriers. Um, I had one principal tell me, hey, you know, one district, we're just gonna take off prereqs. Let's make sure if a kid is, has some courses, but at the same time has the will, is motivated, let's, let's, let's scaffold them and let's really begin supporting access and success in these pathways. And so really helping that mindset shift and removing the barriers and giving scaffold and support. And then synergizing. So these are the beginning of our, the elements that I think are really making a huge difference. Where do we still need to go? We need to continue removing our low hanging barriers, both at the state, district, and school level. Statewide, policy-wise, y'all have done a phenomenal job with that. So now with district and school, how do we continue to remove those barriers? Um, mindset barriers as well as requirements, as well as other barriers. Str being strategic, how do we program intentionally K-12 for a rigor and really ensuring our students have access all along to be prepared for these opportunities. Keep increasing PD, technical assistance. So we can look at data and we can build capacity. And with your leadership, really looking at the systemic groundwater issues. This is you know, permeating through everything and I, I really appreciate that groundwater analogy they used. I've been using it, gosh, starting that next day with this and it really has stuck <coughs> with me as a great way to discuss it and that's what it is, is how are we now gonna really dig deeper um, and in this project in particular, because we have made such great progress. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathleen, who's gonna dig a little deeper into the um, other data, and they're gonna switch the, okay. the thing for you. Please. Hi, everyone. Chairman Davis, Vice Chairman uh, Duncan, board members, thank you so much for your time today. Just to celebrate the great work of our um, schools and districts, um, my name is Kathleen Cook. I am the Senior Director for the North Carolina AP Partnership, and it's just a pleasure um, to, to be with you and share some of the great work um, of our teachers and our students and our district leaders um, in the state. So what you see here is a photo that was taken on May 30th here at the Capitol. It was our first annual AP Day at the Capitol. We brought over 140 superintendents, teachers, students, AP students to the Capitol and they visited with our legislators um, and talked about the experiences they were having in their AP classrooms. It was probably the best day of my professional career um, just because uh, to see students advocating for themselves and to see um, them empowered to do so in such articulate ways was just really inspiring uh, to me as a, I've, I've been an educator my whole career. Um, I started uh, my educational journey as an AP teacher and so it just uh, it made me very happy. It was a great day. Um, so that work paid off and we did get an increase to our appropriation this year which we're very very grateful for and we're pouring every cent of that increase into uh, more teacher PD uh, more opportunities for our students and so I'll share some of those with you as we move forward today 
So here's sort of an overview of um, the data as we've seen it grow throughout the um, lifetime of the partnership. We started things off in 2014. You'll see that big leap in the blue bar is the number of exams. Uh, that took the big leap in 2014 to 2015 because 2015 was the first year we paid, uh, the state paid for all exam fees and removed that financial burden. burden. As Taneha said, we've had incredible growth. When you think about the number of students participating in AP, you've seen a 32% increase over the history of the partnership. And my friends, that represents over 18,500 more kids this year uh, testing in AP than ever before. That's really exciting. Those are each number is a real kid, as you know, and so that makes, makes me um, really proud for our districts. Um, this represents a 33% increase in the number of exams over that same time. And probably, for me, the most exciting number on here is the last one, which is the 27% increase in the number of exams receiving a score of three, four, or five. And I'm going to note why that's especially meaningful now, because our UNC system partners have really stepped up to the plate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Probably the most exciting thing you'll hear from me today, um, because it's such a paradigm shift. So this slide highlights our underserved students. As Saneha said, this is what we love to do our happy dance about, is that these increases are really bringing um, our AP classrooms to represent the demographics of our schools, so that you walk into an AP classroom and you see kids from every walk of life. It's uh, Geography is not determining uh, their participation in these opportunities, and neither is um, the color of their skin or their background. So we're just thrilled with these double-digit numbers. As Seneha said, we have seen a slow a little bit this year. I will point out that our black students this year Although their participation didn't grow, their performance did, 4.2% increase again. So we see the sustained narrowing of what I call the gap between participation and performance. We will not be satisfied until, if we go back to that slide, until the, uh, the red bar meets the, the blue bar, the exams, right? We want every exam to be a 3, 4, or 5 and earn college credit. But what I can tell you is that that gap is narrowing. And that's, that's really joyous news um, for our state. So here's our 10-year. Uh, story. The last decade has just seen incredible gains across our state and again especially for those underrepresented underserved students who um, are really invited to the table like never before. So um, Sineha said that I would share with you how we're making good use of these funds that we've been um, so blessed by our legislator to provide to our districts. So I've listed for you um, some of the PD that we bring to your districts. Uh, a lot of this is pretty, uh, it may not be self-evident what these things are, but I'm happy to take any questions and explain them further. Um, those things listed in bold are what we reserve for our 19 target districts, which I will show you a list of those in a moment. They tend to be more rural districts, uh, smaller districts, some of them a single feeder, feeder pattern, maybe one high school, uh, sometimes two middle schools. Um, uh, those districts we find have very similar challenges. Well, all our districts do. Um, but we bring them together at a central location every year um, to really have them work together to overcome these obstacles. And so you'll see that there was a district leadership colloquium this fall. It was in October. These are great events, guys. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to just hear um, all of our district leaders coming together to problem solve, to really create that pipeline intentionally. In the spring, we'll have a middle level colloquium where we'll bring middle school leaders together because we know that rigor certainly doesn't start when you hit ninth grade. You have to build that pipeline beforehand. And so we're working very intentionally with our leaders uh, to talk about strategies to do that. And then you'll see uh, there's something new this year that we're very excited about. We're going to uh, take some folks to the mountains in the spring. Um, we're calling it our Vertical Articulation Summit. And this is an idea of an off-site opportunity for our district leaders to come together and really strategize to have the time to do that. We're thrilled that the Blumenthal Foundation has partnered with us and they're gonna make Wild Acres available to us. Some of you have been to that very special place on a mountaintop in Little Switzerland. It's a wonderful um, place to kind of step away and to really strategize. So we're excited about that new event for those districts. The other events listed are statewide. So as Seneha mentioned, it was really important when we formed this partnership that we serve all um, 100 and what are we at, 17 LEAs now um, across the state. And so we wanted to make sure that all of them could take advantage. So my main job is to be giving out uh, scholarships to all of these opportunities. So I would ask you board members, if you're ever with the district and they don't know about these opportunities, this is free PD to them, no strings attached, they need to take advantage. 
Um, for the most part, most of our districts have found us and they do a great job. Um, I'm looking at Janet Mason and then, you know, Rutherford, they take advantage of every single opportunity we give them. Um, and so there are, there are many uh, districts like that, but there are some who I think we would still love to see participate a little bit more. Um, so we need your advocacy for that. The biggest thing I'll note on this slide is the AP Summer Institutes. Many of you know that's the five day uh, opportunity for s teachers to go, not just when they're new AP teachers, but we encourage them to go every few years just to kind of get their game uh, refreshed and to learn with colleagues. So here are our target districts uh, this year. This list has changed a little bit over time. We've had some districts who we started with four years ago who have really built such a strong internal capacity. They've sort of rolled off in a sense. Um, we still serve them. We call them now our tier two districts, but this is who we call our tier one. Um, you can see we are represented now across the state. We started out with a focus in mostly Eastern North Carolina, but we've really moved, uh, brought on some districts from the mountains. Uh, in Western North Carolina, but all of these districts have committed to participating in our PD. They've committed to um, sending representatives to those uh, opportunities that I mentioned, and they're uh, making great gains. We also work, of course, closely with them one-on-one. -on -one. We go in, we do walkthroughs with them, we meet with their leadership teams, we talk about data, do data dives, all of those good things to really get um, great conversation going. Um, I want to lift up two of those districts, Lexington City Schools and Yancey County Schools. Um, Yancey especially because it's their second year in a row. Uh, they've just been recognized, guys, the, the official announcement, it's actually embargoed until tomorrow. But these are our AP District <laughs> Honor Rolls. We'll just talk about it today. You know, I, I break the rules all the time. So, you know, they can come and get me, you know, the AP police. But I just had to lift them up because I'm thrill so thrilled for them. This is a recognition that not only have these districts increased their total number of students participating in AP, but guys, they've also increased the number of students performing in AP at the same time, and it's over three years, so it's longitudinal. So really exceptional. So um, if you see Dr. Wells or Dr. Tipton, please um, give them you know, some kudos. Um, we are, we're just really proud of them. Uh, all right, so I'm, I sort of foreshadowed this, and I'm not gonna take up a whole lot of time, but I wanted to let you know that a lot of us, as we've been doing this work over the past four years, in North Carolina have said, this is great, but then what happens? Do our kids actually get credit at the university level for those scores? And this seems like a really big boulder to move. I remember conversations just a couple years ago when it seemed like this university system, we just weren't gonna be able to make this thing happen. And guys, something happened, I don't know. Some magic water got drank, I don't know. But we are thrilled to report that on July 27th, the UNC Board of Governors voted unanimously to pass an AP credit policy in North Carolina. What this means is that on, in all 17 campuses of the UNC system, they will now award students with credit for three, four, or five um, on their AP exams. And yeah, cheer, right? I mean, this is a really big deal. So this is credit that our students have earned. We're so excited that they're being recognized for it. I am not a representative from the UNC system, so I'm not gonna pretend to know everything about this policy, but we, uh, in the College Board, we have a higher ed division, and my colleagues in that division have worked very closely with the UNC system. They are writing the policy as we speak. I have the policy section number here for you, um, and I've heard tell that we're going to get this language very, very soon. But what I can tell you is that um, it will provide consistency across our UNC system. It will certainly allow more of our students to get credit. And so we worked, uh, as we worked through this endeavor with the system office, one of the things they asked us for, um, they had their rationale, which is up on the screen. This does a lot of great things for them. It really takes them toward their strategic goal in so many ways. But they wanted, of course, this to be evidence-based. And so we did provide them with some evidence. So I have um, some of that evidence here for you. Just if you or your constituents ask you why this happened, I want you to be able to articulate why that was. And so I'm just gonna quickly run through um, some of this evidence. But the, the most basic is probably the thing that all of us think about. This saves real money for our families, right, Absolutely. across North Carolina. So it reduces the tuition costs, it improves pathways to degree completion, which is what the UNC system office is, is very invested in as well. It addresses what they call their equity imperative, right? 
And you're gonna see that on this data that I share in the following slides. So this first slide is actually from a College Board report. And we use this all the time because this is good news for all of our AP test takers. It tells us that no matter what a student scores on the AP exam, they are going to be closer to completing their degree in four years, right? So this is about outcomes. So earning AP credits before enrolling in college is correlated with student success in college. Uh, that's probably not a big surprise to many of you, right? Um, but some of these following slides are pretty amazing. So we went ahead and, and really dug in and looked at, well, if we look at students from rural counties, how would a policy like this affect them? And what we found was that students from rural counties in North Carolina could receive up to 46% more course credit with this policy in place. 46%, you guys, think about the cost savings for our families. It's just incredible. Um, we looked at uh, those low-income students. Again, a very comparable number. Again, 46% more courses uh, for families um, earning 60000 a year or less. And finally, our Hispanic and our um, African-American students, we found for African-Americans, uh, likely f over 50%, and the statistic 52%, uh, more students will be eligible to receive college credit, and for our Hispanic students, 42%. So again, this is projected data, but it's, it's compelling, right? And it tells us, and it told the university system, there really is a need here. And so I'm just very grateful that they've stepped up. Um, to respond to this need. And then finally, our, our community college system, I know there are some friends in the house from this system, um, they've said, well, we wanna join the party. So we are working closely with them so that they will do the same as well and make sure that their policies are transparent toward credit for a three plus. So guys, all I can say is it really completes a circle that we've been wanting to close for a long time. And so we're really excited about that. So again, thank you so much, Kathleen and her entire team for their work here in North Carolina. We're just so grateful um, for that. And um, this remains to be a project um, that really helps to move your mission and vision forward. Michelle Coltrane, Ms. Cook, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the clearly thoughtful and strategic nature of this program. And Absolutely. The results that we're getting. Let me get a couple questions and comments before we go to lunch. You, you want me no, to go first? We start here. No, okay, good. just a quick no. question. Um, given administering the test um, in May only, um, has that been. We're sorry, your conference is ending now. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, Mr. Walsh. Okay. Um, but that's, that is uh, a humongous barrier, uh, especially for um, I know my kids, if not, and we have a large minority population. Um, reason being, um, you have two choices. You can either take it in the uh, fall semester and then hope you remember what you were taught to, to take the test in May or you can take it in the spring semester and then your semester is cut 30 days short well, 20 days short um, and then you can give it year long and that pushes kids away because now they've given up an elective or something else they could have had for the second semester. So I, that, that's just one sure. huge barrier in my area, sure. the reason why they don't. So this is why the Department of College Board really encourages year-long courses. Um, <laughs> because of this nature, we're one of the few states that actually do block like we right. do. Right. Um, and so if you do have a block schedule, we have lots of ideas, okay. like a skinny or an A-B schedule because neither one of those options are effective. We actually discourage school districts from doing a pre and an AP. You're taking away two years of a student's coursework. That is not something we, we feel good about. We actually discourage it strongly. Um, and I'm happy to, that's why I wanted to be the one to say, we discourage it strongly out to everybody who's listening. Um, and that there are ways even within the block to do a year long with a skinny or an AB, but ideally um, across the year so that way it is in May and a student is better prepared. So that's not possible to no, administer more than No, the college board will not be doing that. Partly mm -hmm. due to all of the individualized readings that they do with right. hundreds of thousands of tests coming in. Also, it's, it's one of the few states that even has that. So it doesn't meet any of their, of their needs there. Mr. Duncan. This is a, actually a data question. I know many years ago now, and I'm thinking these, this class is filtering about to where they graduate. We changed the kindergarten age starting from October 15th back to September 1st, and that class was smaller. Correspondent, what year does that class graduate? 
Um, so that class is actually my daughter's class. who's in ninth grade this year. Okay. So and it'll be in a few years. So that's Which is why percentages is kind of what I like to always work with for that really good yeah. reason. Okay, but that's a good thing to keep in mind yeah. for our data as we look forward. Absolutely. And, and, and as a fun historical fact, the legislative leader in that legislation may be on the phone, Treasurer Falwell. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right. Um, just a quick comment on the tracking. Uh, uh, it'd be interesting to continue to track issues that perhaps don't elevate. For example, uh, participation on participation, uh, uh, early childhood education, uh, implementation of whole child, some of those kinds of things that might not be the obvious <laughs> things to track, but uh, I think if, uh, if that foundation is there in those early years, uh, how many times am I going to quote Christian on this? But, uh, <laughs> as the, many uh, as you want. <laughs> that's, uh, it, those are critical factors later on, and I think the same folks that are exposed to those kinds of opportunities will be participating in in the, uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Dr. Mason. My question is just regarding the um, equalization of the community college courses with the AP regarding GPA mm -hmm. and how you are seeing that or not seeing that um, really affect students' motivation to take the courses or, or choosing one over the other. Sure. Answer. So what we're hearing um, across the from several school districts is that it is providing a lot more opportunities for sure for students to think about other kind of courses that they could take. Um, we're also hearing um, that in some places, which could be a factor for our AP numbers this, this year with enrollment, is that it is um, possibly leaning more towards the community college side than the AP. So we are hearing lots of different things. What we encourage our school districts and our high schools to do is to really look at a plan of a student's study, really looking at um, their post-secondary experiences, how to ensure the most effective route. Um, I think the, this UNC policy will also help, and that is guaranteed credit. It used to depend per institution, um, and so I, I hope that will also help to help look at opportunities on equal footing. But it is a concern that we are hearing, Dr. Mason. Other questions? One comment I'd make is to the degree that we're in these discussions with the university, the more we can push for some clarity on general education course credit versus just elective course credit. Elective course credit is yes. nice, yep. but it doesn't drive yes. down costs for students as much right. and allow them to get moving. Right. Wild Acres is great. Let's have a board meeting there. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's where my in-laws honeymoon. They want to go to Switzerland, but they went to Little Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think we're going to. Yes, we will. We will break for lunch. Thank let's, you very much. Let's be back at 125. Bring your lunch with you, and we'll get back to work. Okay. We'll recess till 125. <laughs> 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 <laughs>